wonderful weekend and a happy Halloween. That's right, Halloween was this weekend. Um, must have been difficult for so many families and so many disappointed children, what with um, social distancing and the quarantine due to the virus going on right now. I know with my kids, we didn't go trick-or-treating like we typically do, and my daughter in particular was really disappointed. It just about broke my heart. But I did uh, make sure to go to the, the store, and I let them each pick out bagfuls of candy. And not, not the little itty-bitty bars. Man, they each got like dozens of big old bars, and I'm trying to space it out. I don't want them to get sick, right? So on Halloween night, I let them each have two nice big candy bars, and then for dessert af after dinner, for the next several weeks, they're each going to be able to have one of the big candy bars from their Halloween stash. So this way, Halloween, the joy of Halloween is being stretched a little bit, and uh, they still get lots of candy. Hoping next year will be a very different year. Hoping Halloween next year, will, things will be a little bit back to normal, because I'm looking forward to sitting down and helping the kids with their costume. Uh, what else is going on? Election results tomorrow. Holy cow, 2020 couldn't be over soon enough, I can't tell you. Uh, people have been um, going on and on about it and voting this entire time. You know what I'm mostly looking forward to? The end to all of the spam robocalls. At least three or four times a day, I will get a telephone call from some campaign for some person that I, I don't even know. And they're like, yes, I'm here talking about such and such, a state representative for such and such, and, you know, she really fought for the veterans, or, you know, she's been on the side of women, and, you know, she's been, and I'm sitting here just, haven't spoken a word yet, haven't asked me how my day's going, they called me, they don't even know my name right now, they're like, yeah, and they just keep talking, it's just, every day, two or three of these calls from these people just trying to solicit my vote, and the texts, when did this start happening, just getting random texts from people campaigning for their chosen candidate. Both sides of the aisle. I mean, I don't even care what the party is. They're just texting me and want me to click on a link and ensure that I'm voting for yada yada. So yeah, it'll be it'll be really good when tomorrow is over. But until then, what say you and me? Head on over to the Winchester. And just wait for this all to boil over, right? And that's what we're doing today. A bit of disco Elysium, waiting for this all to blow over. And then tomorrow, man, tomorrow's gonna be a chaotic stream. <laughs> I'm going to be doing Wasteland 3 tomorrow, and uh, probably, I, I don't know, when do the results come in tomorrow? I don't know. God, I just don't even care right now. I mean, I, I, mean, I do care. It's, it's an important election, and, you know, I don't talk about politics, but I do have political thoughts. Um, but, uh, man, it's just so mind-wrenching. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it all being over, and we can just go back to things as usual. Ah, things, speaking of things as usual, let's see. I was late again today, about 35 minutes late, as usual. I don't even really have an excuse this time. Uh, I mean, it's just taken me longer to get ready. And, you know, I used to have it down like, okay, I could, I could wake up with an hour before the broadcast, and that's enough time for me to do absolutely everything. I mean, now, now I've got to make my coffee, take a shower, get dressed, you know, do all the personal hygiene things, check on the kids, make sure they're set up for their social distancing learning and all of that. It's just taking longer than an hour, so my entire schedule is off, and I don't know, it's difficult to, to predict how long it's going to take me to get ready in the morning, but you know what I didn't forget? I didn't forget my coffee. Mm. Oh, there's nothing better than a pint of coffee in the morning. Nothing, nothing better. Gotta stay hydrated. You know, the idea that coffee dehydrates you is a myth. I mean, it does. I mean, the coffee does dehydrate you. But the sheer bulk of fluid that you're intaking offsets any amount of dehydration that caffeine has on your system. So, especially if you're, if you're drinking coffee the way I drink coffee, I mean, you're not really getting dehydrated. So, I'm, I'm feeling okay. All right, let me check YouTube and Facebook to see if uh, the chat is up yet. Why does it say The Witcher 3? The coffee dehydrates. All right, for some reason, the thumbnail on YouTube is completely wrong. Even though everything else about the broadcast is right, it still says I'm playing The Witcher 3. 
I'm not. I'm playing Disco Elysium today. All right. Well, I can't fix it right now, but I'll fix it in time for the video on demand later. And then let's see if uh, I'm live on Facebook here. I think I am in time for the video on demand. Yeah, yeah, there we go. All right, Julian on Facebook. So good to see you, my friend. Spencer, Matthew, Katie, Jutong, uh, and Danny. Good to see everybody on Facebook today. And it's wonderful to see all of the regulars and members and Patreon subscribers and mods in the chat today on YouTube. Alt Grendel, Vladimir, the new guy, Chidinator, Stephen Ambrosio, Sarge Games, Quintaius, Sesh the Cat, Slatty Bartfast, Von Reck, Jocelyn Ryan, Tara, Automatic Beats, The Man from Vault 69, Justice, Julian Z, Brett Bus, Alt Grendel, Don Point, and Tara, Jessica Sharp. Uh, 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 Julian says, Good, hello, and good morning, Oxon. I love politics, but your stream is a nice change of pace. Not asking your party preference or who you're voting for, but did you vote? Do you have a philosophy on voting? I do. You want to know Oxhorn's philosophy on voting? I did vote. <clears throat> now, I, I live in a state where it doesn't really matter if you vote. I mean, it matters, but it doesn't. Because this state ha has a political lean, lean. It leans one way politically. And, and it has for decades. As long as I can remember, this state has always been uh, a state for one political party. We have one political party dominates the House, dominates the Senate, dominates the governor, domi dominates the legislature, just dominates everything. So it kind of doesn't matter how you vote. For, I mean, for the past several decades, the uh, presidential candidate that has been nominated from my state has just been from one party and always the same party. So if you are, are, if you support that party, it kind of doesn't matter if you vote because you already know your guy's gonna win F from your state. If you don't support that party, it kind of doesn't matter if you vote because you know that even if you do, the other guy's gonna get the nomination, right? That's how many people feel in my state because it's such a polarized state. It's not a tough competition here. Like, it, it leans one way. Despite all of that, I, I still chose to vote um, because not, not only, you know, it's, it's a privilege and all of that stuff, but because I want to be able to tell my kids someday that I voted one way or another. And, and I also think that um, there's also your own personal story that you're telling throughout your life. I mean, you can look back 30 years from now and say, yeah, during the contentious election, during a global pandemic of 2020, I remember that election vividly and I voted, right? And you can tell these stories to your children and your grandchildren. And, and even if you don't have anyone that you're going to be telling stories to later on, <clears throat> there's kind of, there's the thing of not wanting to have regret, right? I mean, let's say, let's say something awful happens in 10 years or 20 years, and it's a direct result of the decisions that are being made now. We don't want to be sitting around going, I could have done something, but I didn't, right? Of course, there's always the risk that the bad things that happen are directly a result of the votes we made. <laughs> like, like maybe we had cast a vote for the awful thing that happens. Whoops. I mean, we can't, pre I mean, some...
Ah. Oh. Half a pint down. Where were we? Man. I completely... Oh! Oh, that's right. We need to go back to the uh, building. That's what we need to do now. Now, um... The Void. There's that one skill check with Joyce that we have been unable to get. And somebody on Twitter told me that there was a book we found in the bookstore that talked about The Void. So let's go to the bookstore, see if we can find that book. If we can, we'll try to pass that dialogue check with Joyce. And if we can't, we'll just go into the building. Uh, Vladimir says, Feld is a point of no return. Find your gun. Speak with Joyce about the pail. Ask the janitor and get into the closed apartment. Buy the we're all game or not. Oh, is it really? Uh... Okay, well, I'm gonna. I'm working on the pail. I said void, didn't I? I meant pail. I don't know where my gun is. I don't know where to find my gun. I mean, I assume that it was in the car rack. If you've got any advice on where I can start looking to find my gun, I mean, let me know now. Ask the janitor and get into the closed apartment. Where's the janitor? All right, I'll check out the apartments after this. Dick Mullen. Everyone knows the most interesting thing about fascists was their magic. I mean, yeah, the, the occult part of fascism is really weird and interesting. All right, it's not here. We got the map. There we go. Medicinal purposes of the pale for real. Indeed, she mumbles, staring at the book for a moment. Something about that book doesn't s does seem to have spoken to you. Well, I hope it contains what you're looking for. Okay, I remember this from probably our first broadcast. Book, medicinal purposes of... Uh, the Pale. The cover of this heavy tome features a number of esoteric symbols. We can open the book. Flipping through the book, you find a number of sections on the general benefits of the Pale. A large pharmaco uh, pharmacopoeia takes up nearly half of the book. What's a pharmacopoeia? You come across the following explanation. While modern pharmacopoeia are continually updated by so-called experts based on the results of clinical trials, readers will find assembled here the timeless wisdom relied upon by generations of traditional seal-like medicinal practitioners, mesk mystics, and ilmarin folk doctors. Finally, says Inland Empire, something to calm the angry spirits that have been plaguing you. It seems to contain descriptions of the medicinal properties of various ingredients that may be gathered from the pale, as well as instructions for producing a variety of herbal remedies. Is there anything in there about restoring lost memories, we can ask? And there are a number of uh, seal light tonics that promise to improve our short-term memory, but nothing that speaks to our condition. Well, I just want something that will soothe the relentless torment of my existence. What we are describing is booze. We don't see any herbs for that. <laughs> Anything about curing an apocalyptic hangover? We can inquire. There's nothing in here that speaks to hangovers directly. However, while browsing through the various descriptions, we become convinced that we could assemble something from the ingredients listed here. Want to give it a shot? We can rub our hands together and say, all right, book, let's see what you got. First, we need to choose a base ingredient. And we have three options. Ginger root, a sprig of fresh mint, or common meadow rue. I mean, I think I would want to go with mint, but I suppose that's too toothpaste -y, So let's go with ginger root. Ginger's the base of hocus pocus stuff, right? All right, next, you'll need to combine the base ingredient with an appropriate vehicle. We could mix it with a dram of whiskey, 
Boil it with tea and made from birch bark. Ugh. Mesh it into a paste with some aloe vera extract. Oh, we're going to mix it with a dram of whiskey. Lastly, is there anything else you'd like to add? A few pomegranate seeds, a spoonful of sugar, some wild ginseng root. More ginseng to my ginseng? Let's try a spoonful of sugar. And we gain five experience. You've created a delicious tincture of whiskey and ginger. According to the pharmacopoeia, uh, it should increase your energy and focus. Though, in your experience, it's only done the opposite. If only you could find one of these right now and drink the crap out of it. The book said it's good for you, so it would be okay. Would you like to try again? Okay. <laughs> Let's try a sprig of fresh mint. Let's boil it with birch bark and add some pomegranate seeds. We've created a delicious tincture of whiskey and ginger. Wait a minute, it's the same thing. Ooh, it didn't update after we changed our choices. Fascinating. All right, well, we'll close that. So all we can do is concoct a hangover cure. Let's try meadow rue, mash into a paste, and add some ginseng root. Oh, but this doesn't update. It's the same dialogue. All right, well, we can close the book and put the book away. Well, I wonder if that updates um, our dialogue. Durag says, I beat the game yesterday. I hope they make a second one. Also, if you ask Annette again, you can get your hat back. Oh, I can? Hey, great. Pavel says, sorry, it's my fault. First time I'm writing about the pale. I call it the void to be more clearer for you. What is it? Oh, that's right. It is the pale. Well, we learned a bit more. Hey, cool. Now we can go get our hat back. I have no idea where to find our gun. CHA North says, good morning, Ox. Working on some college homework while enjoying listening to your stream in the background. Your sense of humor and calm demeanor are most welcome in these chaotic times. Thank you, sir, for everything you do. Well, thank you very much, CJ North. I'm glad you made it to the program. Now, the only thing I can think of to get our gun back, I think I'm off. There we go. Is to go to Everard and do that little chore for him, which I was reluctant to do because I don't want to become a stooge for a union mob. But he did say he could get us our gun back. So do I need to do that first before I go into the building? Jessica says, did you see my tweet about Visage? Yes, did you see my schedule from last night where I said I was going to do Visage in place of Resident Evil 2? So for Scotch and Smoke Rings, we're going to do Visage. Um, until we finish it, and then we'll go back to Resident Evil 2 to explore Claire's story. Edit, 55 real. Okay, let's go buy the board game. Let's buy the Dick Mullins book as well. Uh, as well. And then I suppose we need to go back to Everart and get our gun. Uh, the Rural game. That's 25 real. Holy cow, that's half of what we've got. Jessica says you have to start all over. You can't use the saves from early access. Really? Oh, no. Really? Uh, well, then maybe I could play it offline and get to the point where I was. But I'll, I'll have to solve all those puzzles again. And I don't remember. Brad Bus says, ah, Visage, guess I'll buy some adult diapers. Never know. Yeah, you might need, not, might need them. Crap. All right, let's buy. We're all. Now we're down to 30. Sue's ranty. Oh, I can't. Why can't I buy this one? Oh, because I already did? I want to buy the man from Heimdall and the Devil Woman? Why can't we buy this one? I guess we can. All right, well, we just spent all of our money.
Large letters on the front form a title, Weral. The colorful box is illustrated with bucolic vistas. The cover art also features odd-looking humanoids, some short, some taller, some with pointy ears, others with ephemeral wings. We can examine the box. Text underneath the title in smaller typeface, re a a typeface reads, Third Edition Mega Setting Supplements Module. The side panel adds, A sword and sorcery adventure board game with new maps and miniatures. Nick Butler says, Hello, Papa Ox. Happy election and ad victorium. Here's hoping everything runs smooth tomorrow. Yeah, let's cross our fingers. Thank you for that. We can look at the back. A blurb on the back reads, Tired of the tedium and toil of modern life, escape to Wiral. Leave behind Izolas and nations with their petty squabbles. Discard electricity and magnets and boring technological widgets. Succumb to a world of high pasternal uh, fantastique. Unleash your imagination and create an adventure of endless possibilities. Discover the terrible secret threatening Wiral. Can your band of adventurers save the world? Yes, we're ready to take on this challenge, we can say. Exactly. That's the spirit, says the board game we're having a conversation with. All you have to do is read an intricate rule book, study an assortment of maps, unfold the illustrated game board, and start rolling the dice. In no time, you could be romping through grasslands with low-level characters, hunted by Isekel riders, or battling unspeakable monsters in endless dungeons, fraught with danger and despair, conjuring up forces forceful magics to aid your quest. All right, let's shake the box. Mysterious things rattle inside. What could they be? Dice, plastic miniatures, a fantastical alternate, alternate world full of magic and wonder. None of that witless man from Heimdall fascist dross. <laughs> Hidden behind full realistic allegory, Wiral is a no-cliché-ridden apologia. Uh, apologia for colonial violence. Wiral is pure imagination. Was well, this supposed to be like Disco Elysium? We pass a rhetoric check. Yes, this Wiral setting is known for its complicated system of political alignments. But if you're not into that, you can just hack your way through dungeons and search for loot. That's what most people do. All right, we can open the box. You pry open the box inside. We find a folded up map, a small booklet, a 24-sided die, and a little plastic figurine. We can look at the map. A reprint of a crude hand-drawn map. The top left corner reads, Lands of Wiral. The map features both small villages and mid-sized towns with odd names, in addition to meadows, forests, hills, lakes, and seas, also with odd names. It doesn't seem to correspond with anything you've seen thus far. It's not a very helpful map. Oh, we can look at the booklet. A quick guide to the magical races of Wiral. Create your own hero choosing from any of these completely unique and fantastical backgrounds. The options are, in order of importance, the Welkin, the Dwerorger, the humans, the fairy folk, and the pygmies. Well, we can read about the Welkin. The Welkin, tall, lithe, and graceful, with long flowing hair and pointy ears, they're known for being powerful magic users, but can also hold their own in a brawn-driven fight. We can read about the Dwayogre. A grand race of industrious mountain people. They're short, stout, and muscular, and enjoy digging for gold and other precious minerals. They're also well-versed in the art of combat, where they prefer to use axes and hammers. The dwarves <laughs> also come in a few different sub-races. Hill dwarves, shield dwarves, and dark dwarves. Oh, well, we can read about the humans. They're just humans. What else is there to tell? <clears throat> they are average in all stats and jacks of all trades. We can read about the fairy folk, a very small race of flying people known for being mischievous, full of trickery. They often lure people into their magical traps. There are no sub-races for the fairies. And finally, we can read about the pygmies. The least popular of the Weral races, the pygmies are short, rotund, and dim-witted. Pygmies live in small villages made of shoddy wooden dwellings. They spend most of their days tilling the earth and smoking their pipes. There are no sub-races for the pygmies. But everybody loves the halflings. I don't understand. We could look at the die. It's made from some sort of wood and has been decorated with a peculiar plant motif. We can take the die, 
We place the die into our pocket. It's always good to have luck on our side. We can look at the figurine. We see a man in ragged clothes, wearing a lopsided hat and wielding some sort of firearm. Ha, huh, interesting. A communard, says Kim. A what, we can say? A communard, he repeats. One of the leftist revolutionaries in the anti-centennial revolution. What's so interesting about that? The figurine is not a part of the We're All Game setting. I guess someone misplaced it during the packaging process. Does this mean we <laughs> we can't play, we can say? Or maybe someone should make a role-playing game set during the revolution, we can say. And Kim says, hmm, good luck finding people who'd want to play as communards. We can take the figurine. We pick the figurine up by the base and to meet our gaze, the little plastic man stares back at us, his face contorted into a disturbing shout. Then we pocket it, and we can close the box, and we can put the box away. All right, the game is interacted with. Next, we can interact with the suzerainty board game. In our hands, we hold a brand new copy of the game suzerainty. It's snugly wrapped in a skin of plastic. The cover features a charming illustration depicting a mass of grinning laborers loading goods onto a ship while a richly dressed administrator oversees their work. We can shake the box. The box has a nice heft to it. We hear the rattle of individual wooden tokens and feel their weight shifting back and forth. What treasures wait in store for us, says Inland Empire. Even before we open it, we can tell that this will be a meaty game of grand strategy and complex player interactions. We can remove the plastic wrap. The plastic wrap rips off as easily as a bodice in a tawdry historical romance. We can open the box. <clears throat> Julian Z says, I personally wouldn't mind watching you replay Visage from the beginning. It would be fun watching you get scared and dying suddenly walking down a hall. Yeah, but I don't know. It's less fun when I know how to do the puzzle, and then it just uh, it becomes you know walking through and trying to find the right pieces to do the puzzle again. There's a hiss as the lid slides off. Inside, we find a thick, full-color rule book and more than a dozen pouches of various wooden components. Ah, savor that new board game smell. A mix of wood, paper, and ink, all wrapped in the sweet must of cardboard. We can read the rule book. Welcome to the Suzerainty, a game of economic strategy for the whole family. The rule book is sumptuously illustrated and thick, and thick as a gradient novel. Um... Okay, finally, a proper game to teach children about the importance of trade in the global economy. The colorful illustrations depict cheerful workers picking apricots, hauling marble sculptures out of the crumbling temples, oh God, and harvesting a strange magenta-leafed plant. Everyone is smiling. We begin to suspect there may be a political agenda to this so-called family game. Only one way to find out, and we can keep reading. The instructions are opaque at first and introduce many concepts we are not familiar with. Fortunately, there are many diagrams and examples throughout. We soon figure out the basic conceit. Each player represents an administrator for the suzerain of Revachal. Our objective is to increase the suzerain's wealth and renown by accumulating victory points. Okay, well, how do we accumulate victory points? That's where the suzerain's vassals come in. The game features four vassal nations, each one home to an economically important resource. Each turn, the player collects resources from vassals where they've placed workers. They may then rearrange their workers, fulfill contracts for coin and bonuses, or build structures back in Revachal. As we leaf through the pages, our eye catches on a sidebar labeled Advice for Beginners. Okay, we can read the advice. Remember, there are many paths to victory in Suzerainty. But successful players will find one strategy to commit to it and commit to it wholeheartedly. Boring, boring, boring. Tear up the rule book and commit some old school atrocities. <laughs> God. Oh, oh, is, isn't there any way to invade or commit atrocities or anything fun like that? 
Suzerainty is a family game. The only atrocities you'll be committing are against the social standing of your rival administrators, as you bring in ever more resources and power and power for the suzerain. Speaking of, the actual scoring system appears infinitely complex, with a series of tables and appendices required to complete each player's final victory point total. You skip that part for now, God. Hey, and we can examine the components. We open up a number of pouches containing wooden tokens. There are also several punch boards with other cardboard components that we'll need to be punched out before we can play. We can punch out the cardboard pieces one by one. Each cardboard token making a satisfying chick as you pop it out. Soon a neat pile of cardboard coins and counters has accumulated before us. What? Says Kim. You're not going to offer to let me punch any of them? Oh, poor Kim. He wanted to punch some out. We can check out the wooden tokens. In addition to the worker and building tokens used by each player, there are also several piles of colorful resource tokens, each representing one of the game's four principal resources. From the Empire of Safre, orange apricot tokens. From Isle Marat, the ancestral name of Ilmara, gray marble block tokens. From the Seminine Islands, white sacks of sugar tokens and from Supramundi and Ceramiriza magenta tokens for unprocessed cocaine leaves. Oh, those are nice. The lieutenant picks up a sugar token and admires it. Cocaine leaves in a family game. We can put the components away and say, hey, Kim, wanna play? The lieutenant looks over the rule book before he sees something that makes his eyes go wide. Holy crap, the average playing time for this game is one to six hours. Well, it's like risk. I'm not sure we can afford to set aside that kind of time for a game. Ooh, we could pass a suggestion check to convince him to play with us 97%. Come on, we can say. It might help us, oh wait, no. Um, What is detective work if not an elaborate game? We need logical interface, attention to detail, the ability to analyze our opponent's moves, and so we can say to Kim, come on, it might help us think of more creative solutions to the case. Hmm, says Kim, I do feel like my thinking has become somewhat rigid. Maybe a little diversion to keep the mind limber is just what's in order. See, says Suggestion, he's doing the hard work himself. All he needed was a little nudge. All right, you've convinced me, says Kim. How do we play? I read the rules. Okay, we could wing it or we could actually follow the rules. Um, Edward says, love your work, Sir Oxhorn. Please, please. And it flew off the screen. Hold on. Please, please consider playing Baldur's Gate 3. I'll add it to the list. It's definitely worth consideration. Von Rick says, maybe you can do a super secret Twitch stream of Visage to catch up. Everyone else ignores, ignore this clearly visible chat. Well, I mean, if I'm going to be doing it anyway, I suppose I might as well stream it. But it can't be a, an official stream on YouTube because I'd get too many people and they'd watch me make the same mistakes over and over again and die a lot. So if I were to stream it, it would probably have to be a super secret Twitch stream that, you know, where I don't have a lot of subscribers and so fewer people would be there. I certainly wouldn't be talking about it on YouTube like I am right now so that other people might hear about it and expect me to do that in the future because then they might anticipate it, which is the last thing I want. So I better keep that one to myself. But thank you for the idea, Von Reck. Haley says, Ox, your thumbnail to join this live stream is an image of the Witcher, just so you know. Yeah, I don't know why. I uploaded the correct thumbnail. I, I sat down and I made the right thumbnail. I uploaded it to YouTube and instead it used the thumbnail from my last broadcast. Uh, and I don't have an explanation for that. And I can't change it now that I'm live. So change it in post. After we're done, I'll change it in post. I read the rules already. I'll show you, we can say. We explain the basic setup procedures to the lieutenant, who seems to be a quick study. We each take our bags of tokens and counters and unfold the board between us. In the center of the crown is the crown of Revishal. Radiating outward are her colorful vassals, each one supplying some raw material desired by the suzerain. Apricots from Safra, archaeological treasures from Isle Marat, sugar from the Seminine Islands, and magenta cocaine from Supramundi and Saramiriza. Uh, There's also a neat little log to keep track of our progress, in case we need to put the game away and return to it later. The lieutenant goes first. He draws a contract card, 
and moves several of his workers to the Safra territory of the board and the others to the Seminine Islands. Surath says it's buffering ox. Is it me or you? My friend, I've got solid green over here. So it, it, it may be you. All right, detective, your turn, says Kim. We have a few options available to us. We'll, will we try to fulfill contracts right away or rearrange our workers to maximize production on future turns? Remember what the rulebook said? You'll want to choose a strategy early on and stay committed to it. Okay. Just do whatever Kim did. <laughs> well, wait a minute. I don't see the option to maximize production. Instead, we could let our workers rest rest for a bit. That's not maximizing production. Let's let them rest. What? It's the very beginning of the game. Your workers haven't even done any work yet. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, we can let them rest anyway. There's no concept of rest in suzerainty. Workers have to work. You produce a handful of archaeological treasures and a smattering of other resources. Meanwhile, the lieutenant spends two of his sugar and one of his apricot tokens to complete his contract card. He's rewarded with four coins and a round wooden token that he places in the center of the board. That's a market. It's worth two victory points. We can glower silently. The lieutenant returns her baleful look with a satisfied grin. Glancing over the board, we see several possible strategies. Pressing more workers into service would increase your economic output and help you survive a possible conflict with the lieutenant. Or you could ignore your labor supply and focus on fulfilling contracts for points and resources. Those aren't your only options, says Rhetoric. You could also show your workers how much you appreciate them by investing some of that wealth into them. After all, they're the ones producing wealth for the suzerain. <laughs> well, sure, you can do that, says the board game. It's just not a terribly effective strategy, but then it's up to you. So we could invest in our existing workers. We can press more workers into service. We can focus on fulfilling contracts. Or we could say that we're bored. Let's, um... Let's invest in our existing workers. To the lieutenant's puzzlement, you spend several turns building various improvements to your territorial infrastructure. Soon your workers have access to clean water, paved roads, and basic hobbies. In return, they produce one extra resource per turn. Well, we can gaze on our workers like a benevolent parent. Hmm, says Kim. Too bad investing in your workers isn't, it just isn't worth many points. What do you mean, we can say? Take a look at the scoring tables in the back. The lieutenant turns to one of those appendices we skipped over earlier. We see that in table 8C, that investing in territorial infrastructure multiplies our final victory point total by one times. Which is to say, not at all. Whereas erecting monuments in Revachal gives you a multiplier of five times. Wow, so you're saying the values of the ruling class are completely divorced from the well-being of the people who generate their wealth? Or, so you're saying I should treat my workers like disposable labor instead? Or, so you're saying I screwed up? <laughs> Let's see what he says for number two. Yes, precisely, says Kim. <laughs> now it's the lieutenant's turn to respond. He moves aggressively onto the Safra territory. Soon his workers are producing a steady supply of extremely valuable apricots. How can you let the lieutenant dominate you like that? You need to head back and hard. For several turns, we struggle to respond to the lieutenant's burgeoning apricot empire. Eventually, we relocate the majority of our workers to the Supramundi Seramiriz, Mir um, where they begin producing a bumper crop of cocaine tokens. We draw a new contract card. According to the text, there's an aristocrat willing to trade a large supply of cocaine for a number of coins and access to a rare bonus, amplified music, worth seven victory points. Oh, is this how we amplify the music? Will we find the new record? For the guys in the church? Because remember, we got to find a, a new song or something. Oh, yeah, baby. Cocaine and rock music go together like cocaine and rock music. You've reached a critical strategic juncture. How do you respond to the lieutenant's aggression? Rock and roll, baby. We could give back to the workers, attack the lieutenant, and steal all of his resources. Let's go for the contract. 
It takes several turns, but you slowly begin accumulating the cocaine necessary to complete the contract. When we do, it practically rains cardboard coins on our side. Feels good, doesn't it? But you know what would feel even better? Winning the game. Solving the murder. You're going to say drugs, aren't you? Drugs, says electrochemistry. Specifically uppers. You should find some the first chance you get. While we daydream about speed, the lieutenant has built himself a formidable economic engine of his own. The end game is upon you. How will you spend the vast resources you've acquired for the glory of the suzerain? Flipping through the manual, we find the most expensive structure in the game, the Ravisholian victory column, worth 12 victory points. If we can successfully build it, victory will be all assured, but... Alternatively, we could try launching a trade war to crush the lieutenant's economy, or we could blow all of that money on a public education system. <laughs> this game is so pessimistic. <laughs> for our worker tokens. God. The choice is yours. All right, we could go for the victory t token. We could launch a trade war. Well, that recently hasn't gone very well. We could build a public education system for our workers. <laughs> Forget the workers. Let's Let's go for victory. Let's go for the victory column. Building an ultimate structure requires diligent economic planning, which you completely failed to do. Rather than build a glorious monument to Revacol's economic superiority, you have to settle for a handful of post offices and a school for the blind. <laughs> oh, those poor blind people, they ruin our plans again. A risky gambit, detective, says Kim. I'm sorry it didn't pay off. Guess I should have gone with a more consistent strategy, we can say. That might have helped. Yes, says Kim. Now let's tally up the scores, shall we? Computing the final scores is almost a game unto itself. We each spend an inordinate amount of time making stacks of coins, consulting tables, and struggling with basic addition and multiplication. After double and then triple checking our maths, we have our final score. 15 victory points. The suzerain will not be impressed. The lieutenant looks up from his tabulations. I've got 26 points, he says, a barely contained smile breaking out across, across his face. Of course Kim loves board games. He's totally a board game guy. Don't be glum, detective. There's always next time. Figuratively, I mean, there's no way we have time to play this game again. Now let's clean up and get back to work. Oh, man. <laughs> Highlander says the blind are at it again. All right, well, we played Suzerainty. Now let's read, uh, oh, oh, we've got our Conan B the Barbarian spoof book here. Man from Heimdall and the Devil Woman. The edges of the pages are worn and smudged. A lot of people have read about the Devil Woman's altercations with the Heimdall man. Okay, well, we can look at the back cover. The jacket copy proclaims, Man from Heimdall returns in his most exciting adventure yet. After crashing into a strange jungle, cannibalistic natives abduct his only surviving comrade, Noble Turbald. Before Man from Heimdall can mount a rescue, he is ambushed by a tribe of female warriors and taken to the ancient citadel of Cloud City, where a mysterious and wicked queen rules supreme. Will Man from Heimdall be able to escape his dire situation and find his missing friend? Time to flip through the book. We open the book to a random page. Man from Heimdall, wielding his two Zwierhanders, is carving through a sea of dark-skinned savages, his visage fixed in grim determination. His arms, whirling like windmills, are soaked with the blood of his enemies. Mangled corpses litter the battlefield. Good God, this is some retrograde stuff. When was this crap written? Says our rhetoric. We flip to the copyright page. This book was written in 38. We could close it or we could go, oh man, this is gritty and heroic. Or we could try and give it a chance. Berserker rage burns in his azure-hued eyes as he brings glory and honor to his long-lost Himaldalar tribe from the village of Himdal. The ivory giant roars like an ice bear, and the winds of Kitala howl out his name. Oh, give me more! Man from Himdal rides on a gilded griffin, his golden mane billowing in the breeze. Both Zwehanders sheathed on his back, he is off to war. Will he conquer his enemies, 
will he conquer himself? Onward! Miwi says, sorry I'm late. I slept in due to playing a game I waited for a long time. Hugs everyone, including you, Oxhorn, the storyteller. Well, thank you very much, Miwi. Glad you made it. And you know what? I sleep in sometimes too, even when I have a stream, like I kind of did today. And it happens to the best of us. Don't worry about it. Ephraim says, will we be getting an overview of your Fallout 76 character? I watched your videos to determine what's good to do in my games. Um, I don't know if people would find that interesting. I, I kind of just built my characters as I went along. I didn't follow any guides for any of my characters. I used um, perk card builders to kind of choose the cards I liked and uh, the mutations that I liked. So, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I didn't really have a... I had a little bit of a strategy going into it, but after level 50, I just sort of threw things together. I have 36 levels that I haven't done on Oxhorn. He's leveled up 36 times, and I haven't spent any more perk points or gotten any more perk cards on him. So, I've got a lot of upkeep to do on my characters. Basically, after level 50 for Oxhorn, I just didn't care anymore. <laughs> I'm building my character. I got my shotgun. I got my power armor. That was fine. I didn't need to do it. I just started exploring at that point. So, I should probably work on my characters. The steel muscles of man from Heimdall gleam in the humid jungle air, yet the man does not sweat. Well, and where did the gleam come from, I guess, from the humidity? In meditation, his soul drifts in the frigid Northlands. He calls home. Holy crap, this is so me. We can really get into the book. A passage reads, The man from Heimdall looks up, his eyes blue as, they, as the mountain lakes of his homeland. He rarely speaks, but now his voice booms in the darkened throne room. A throne room. Do not try to sap my masculine essence, wicked temptress. Son of Heimdall will never succumb to your seductive wiles. Thine spells are no match for purity and strength of will. Brothers of Heimdall, stand above the vices of flesh, for it is weak and corruptible. Yet mine is forged in gore and strife. Queen Lydiana just laughs, a sultry and salacious sound, then says... <clears throat> I have grand plans for you, man from Hindal. She gestures her diabolical hand toward an array of potions and unguents. First you shall please me, then lead my armies against the vicious cannibals. Not a muscle moves in the face of man from Heimdall, yet inside there is turmoil. This goes against all he holds sacrosanct. We could say that I kept hoping it would get better, but this writing is terrible and, and repetitive. Or we could go, wow, this is epic! In the final pages, man from Heimdall mounts Galawaren, his mighty griffin, and turns his gaze to the horizon. Queen Ledania is dead. But an army of cannibals is storming the gates, and still, no word from trusty Tearbald. To find out what happens next, we have to pick up Man from Heimdall and the Three-Eyed Skull, available in fine bookstores everywhere spring of 39. That's it? Oh, man. Don't I have another Man from Heimdall book? I've got Man from Heimdall and the Devil Woman, and the Man from Heimdall, Heimdaller Man. Okay, so here's the figure set revolutionary. What a nice figurine, a turn-of-the-century leftist revolutionary in ragged clothes. On his head lies a lopsided hat, seemingly an ushanka. In his hand, he carries a little musket. Could we use this in front of the broken stained glass window in the church? Is that the figurine that they were asking for? And then we've got a standard world die. This basic 24-sided role-playing die can be used to get results for several dice. It's made from East Seminese snake wood and embellished with plant motifs. Or plant motives, I guess. It reminds you of Plain and Hill Welkins. Note, look at the map table in the journal to see which white checks have opened. Oh, hey, it opened up some new checks for me. Cool. Doggo says, if you find working with Everart to be distasteful, there is another way later in the story, but you may find yourself feeling remorseful later. All right, well, maybe I'll go work with Everart. Hey, look at all these white checks. Ceiling, Andre, and the novelty dice maker. Well, I knew the novelty dice maker was going to be one, so let's go see the novelty dice maker. 
I'm all out of money now. Wow, that was really expensive. And see what's happened there. Vladimir says, Octi, we'll get a chance to use both figurines much, much later. You say that as if I've got a lot of this game yet to play. I mean, I... Ooh, Kim. It's dark. The lieutenant states the obvious. And the flashlight works a lot better if you hold it in your hand. Okay, fine. Fair point. Yes, totally obvious. Right, now let's go. Okay. So is that it? It was just... You wanted me to put the flashlight in my hand? Okay. Anyway, as I was saying, I was under the distinct impression that I was kind of like close to being done with the game. But is that not the case? Huh. It's a shivers check. Well. Let's go through some of her other dialogue that we've gone through already to see if anything else opens up. Fifty-eight percent. Shivers. Yes. Plus one to shivers. Ooh, plus one to shivers. I might actually do okay here. Oh, that gives me plus one of shivers too. Okay, that's it. I increased my shivers by two points. 83%. A gust of cold air sweeps through the chimney. The stones and minerals on the shelves rattle as though agitated. For a moment, it almost feels as though we are outside the building, exposed to the atmosphere. Two options. We can say, hey, Niha, the curse is real, and I figured out why it has spared you. Or we can say, this is just a theory, but hear me out. I think I know why your business hasn't failed. Didn't we already talk about this? She asks as the wind continues to seep in through the cracks in the old chimney. And we can say, it's because you're not in the sa same building as the others. This isn't technically the doomed commercial area. What are you talking about, she says, shaking her head. My address is exactly the same, Rue de St. Gillazine 10. No. The old coal plant that used to be here was subsumed into the new venture. Its ruins swallowed up, yet it has a different address in the heart of the city. No, we can say this used to be a coal plant, and we can touch the safety curtains. You're in a chimney of another building. This doesn't make any sense, she says. She looks around the makeshift nest uh, that she has carved out for herself, bewildered. Are you saying my business was spared from a technicality? Or because of a technicality? Where is this coming from? Uh... Well, we can say, I'm just using logic. It's windy in here. You probably haven't properly sealed the chimney crown. And we can point to the crown. Hum, she says, looking up. You're right. I should take a trip to the roof once the snow is gone. Does it mean that I'm safe from failure? Don't let her become complacent. She still needs to ward her soul against the evil forces.
Well, we can say no one is ever really safe from failure, and she starts laughing, her fingers trying to rub away the exhaustion from her face. What, we can say. Do you know what this is? She raises her hand to reveal a piece of metal shining on her index finger. Um, your lucky charm, some kind of ward? And she goes, it's a mourning ring, she replies. I made this when my first company failed. It was a small jewelry shop right here in the East Delta Commerce Center, built with the little I inherited from my parents. I drove it to the ground within a year. I didn't have what you call a viable business plan. Why are you telling me this, we can say? And she says, it wasn't just the jewelry shop either. I always thought that it was just the world that you were supposed to try again and again until you finally succeed. And now you're telling me what? And she closes her eyes, that it was all because I didn't run my little shop and ventures from a dump inside an abandoned chimney? Well, we can say, don't call it a dump. You've made it nice and cozy here. And she says, yeah. She stares out of the window, not really hearing our words. Or maybe it's the entire world that's cursed. It's such a precarious place. Nothing ever works out the way we wanted. That's why people like role-playing games. You can be whoever you want to be. You can try again. Still, there's something inherently violent, even about dice rolls. <laughs> it's like every time you cast a die, something disappears. Some alternate ending or an entirely different world. She picks up a pair of dice from the table and examines them under the light. And we gain a new thought, precarious world. But anyway, thank you for sharing your theories, officer. And she gives us a tired smile. Hey, what is this thought? Seems like the point of this game is victory. The absence of defeat on all fronts. Victory in business ventures and creative undertakings. Victory in love and over other people. Political victory. Ideological victory. Hell, even sexual victory. Definitely a lot of object-based victories, too. Having things and not losing them. One problem, though. Not a lot of victories in sight. Everyone's mostly losing. Why is that? And how do you not lose? Well, we're sadly out of room. Though I wonder if I can level up my character. Do I have any points to spend? No. Ephraim says, do you think that Fallout and the Elder Scrolls will become Microsoft exclusives? I'm very scared because I'm a PlayStation player. I doubt that. I think the worst that'll happen is that you'll have to wait a year. And that really is the worst. I don't even know if that will happen. But if anything really bad were to happen, it would be like... It'll come out on the Xbox first, and then six months later on the PC, and then a year later on the PlayStation so they can make more money out of it. That's probably the worst that would happen. Okay, um... So, we've got a couple more white checks that have opened up now that we've got the dice. Let's go knock them out. Then we'll go to Everart to get our gun. Then we'll go to the building. Vladimir says, Ox, this thought doubles the chances of critical failures and critical successes at checks. Well, then it's a thought that cancels itself out. Why would I, why would I get a thought like that? I don't know. Sorry, officer. Well, we don't have the money for the found sneakers. Everything's still cool here, officer. 
Oh, it's the, uh, it's the check to, <laughs> to have him give me money. This is a rhetoric check. Poor, underprivileged grandma. So we learned about his grandma. Hey, quick question. Do you sell any tapes? Tapes? You mean like music tape? Tapes? No, music is out. Don't listen to music. I sell extremely cool sunglasses if you want to get your mojo going. He points to the shoddy box on the left. All right, so you have no idea where whatsoever I could find tapes? Tapes? The notion sounds preposterous to him. Tapes are everywhere. They're worthless. Kids throw them in the trees. They're in the bushes right behind this lorry. He nods at the empty lorry cabin behind his back. No one would ever throw a good pair of high-quality plastic sunglasses in the bushes, mister. And his smile widens to the west dark brown ribbons of tape hanging hang from the trees, flowing in the wind. You should have a look. It's better than nothing. Hey, is this the tape where we're going to get the music that we need to complete the sound inside the uh, church? All right, well, that's difficult, but let's see if I can get some rhetoric gear on. Reaction speed, endurance. Negative one rhetoric. Drama, logic. Gah. One. One to rhetoric. Everything's still cool here, officer. Let's try it. Oh, look at that. Start with a little compliment, then work our way up from there. This is about business, remember? Hey, we can say, you seem like a really successful entrepreneur. Would you like to support a member of the local police force? Oh, okay. The man stops, his face suddenly serious. But why, officer? After all of this mess, the broken seals lying to you? Come on! Think of it as an investment, we can say. An investment? He raises a brow, intrigued. What kind of investment? Or you could not make this about corruption and go with something even wilder. An investment in me, a highly experimental human being, my risk-reward ratio is insane. Investing into me, not telling your employer about your operation here. I'm a policeman. It's an investment in good relations with the RCM. A guy told me I need money to live, otherwise it's game over and I don't want to die. Let's try this, an investment in me. I guess it can't be any riskier than speculating in exotic derivatives. How much are we talking about? A million real? Oh, let's try ten. Ten real is a bargain for that kind of investment. You got it, my man. He takes a ten note from a leather pouch. All right. Ten bucks. Now, there's tape behind his lorry. Ooh, in the tree. The hawthorn tree on Rue de Saint Gillesine, bronze colored ribbons of ma magnetic tape are caught in its branches, fluttering in the breeze. Just like he promised, you've stood here for what seems like eons, uh, guzzling the sickly fumes of lorries and carriages. All right, we could disentangle it. Piss off, nature! We can punch the tree. The hawthorn tree is not an inanimate object. It's a living thing. The thunk against the bark echoes with discontent. <laughs> At first, the distinctive urge felt exhilarating, as if it added something to your persona. But the feeling swiftly receded, leaving you with a sad emptiness. Uh, uh, good hawthorn. We can pat the tree. The hurt feelings of the tree are not alleviated by this sudden display of care and emotion. You manipulative bastard. And we damage our health by patting the tree, not by kicking it. The younger stems and branches are adorned with sharp thorns that scratch our hand. Oh, whatever. This barely registers as damage. It was a retaliation for your earlier assault. The trees, are they plotting something? 
<laughs> what the heck, tree? We can say. Or maybe we can be conspiratorial. My God, nature is plotting an uprising against us. And Kim says, yes, one day grass will grow over our cities and so on. He looks at the tree, very poetic. Better not to dwell on it. What with a murder to solve and all. Um, all right. Ooh, and we get plus two as a karaoke superstar. And we've got the magnetic dice set. Hey. It's 7%. It's 3%. Oh, I'm going to get these 3%. Oh, thank God. With slow and deliberate motions, pulling, bending, and unraveling, we manage to extricate the magnetic tape from the branches. And we get a bundle of magnetic tape. It curls up into a mess inside our pocket. If only we could find a way to re-spool it so that you could hear what's on the tape. The lieutenant looks at the mess in our hands. Only after we've successfully cleaned up the branches does the curiosity get the better of him. What's the tape for, he asks. And we can say it's for Egghead. I promise to make his Van Eyck jam a bit harder. Maybe this tape can help. How? It's broken and unspooled. Do you think your new buddy knows how to fix it? Um... Well, he has to. He's the master of ceremonies, after all. All right. Looks like the lieutenant doesn't really know what that means. You could also get it fixed at the pawn shop across the street. We shouldn't waste our time. Okay. He looks at his wristwatch a little impatiently. You know, since tape spinning isn't really our day job, solving murder investigations is. Good idea. He might have the tools. The tape projector in the pawn shop uses a similar tape. Okay. So we need to go to the pawn shop to re-spool the tape. So Gassity says, look at each equipped uh, uh, clothing item for negative attributes. You had a negative one to rhetoric, and you added the plus one item. They canceled out the summary in the left, and the rhetoric, rhetoric did not show up there. Okay. Uh, good tip, Sagacity. Thank you. I'll do that next time. Welcome to the pawn shop. All right. Hello, hello. Let me know if I can help you with anything. Hey, do you know how to fix this? We can show him the bundle of magnetic tape. He looks at the bronze-colored bundle in our hand. You mean re-spool it? Yeah, I do that, but great! Could you do it, please? This is important. I need to be able to play this tape for someone. He slowly finishes his thought. But I'm not some Mr. Fix-It. I'm a pawnbroker. If you want to pawn the tape, sure. Although it looks pretty worthless. Just explain why you need this so much. He's bound to understand. Yeah. Okay, worthless, we can say. It's not worthless, Roy. This could be the next big thing for the local dance music scene. Huh? He slowly taps his fingers on the counter. What do you mean? Do you know that old church down the coast, we can say? Yes, what about it, he says. I helped some young ravers turn this place into a nightclub, and they play these weird beats there, which they call anodic music. Is it any good? The music, I mean. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> we could say, no, the thing is, you can't believe how unbelievably thin the beat is. There's nothing to, t there's nothing to it. No bass. It just goes, bzzit, bzzit, bzzit. But this tape could make it hardcore. Man, you're really invested in this. He looks at the bundle of tape in front of him. It shimmers under the, t the shop's dazzling light, uh, dazzling light show. Okay, I'll help you, he says. It's going to take a moment, though, so just sit back and relax. We take some time to look around the store. The play of visuals all around the pawn shop is mesmerizing. Suddenly, Roy turns back to you with a reel of tape and in his hand and coughs. Well, thanks for the help, we can say, and we can proceed to take the tape. Yeah, my pleasure. I do what I can for true passion projects. Just try not to use this tape for negative photon emissions. Take responsibility, okay? All right, we got it. Now we can finally find out what hardcore anodic music sounds like. As I'm sure we've all been wondering all our lives, 
What is hardcore anodic music? Now we can find out. The bronze colored tape found in the Hawthorne tree has been reconstructed into a usable reel of mag magnetic tape. It's pretty fragile and in an odd format which doesn't fit into any portable type of tape players. Nevertheless, Egghead will be stoked. Okay. Now. We can try the cargo container door again. And everything else is over there. I still don't know where that warded door is. All right, let's go talk to Everart. Go for the cargo container, says chat. All right, cargo container it is. I keep forgetting which one this is. Mm, volition. Tony J says, try to rhetoric the heck out of that container ox. Oh, I'm going to re rhetoric the snot out of this thing. He's not going to see my rhetoric coming. Vladimir says, ox, it's impossible to open that bunker door, but failing the check gives bonus points to another check later on. Oh, okay. Thank you, Vladimir. Now, somebody said I had... Uh, a rhetoric clothing on. Yeah. Mm. All right, plus one to rhetoric. Erratic yet thorough. Been in the world for a few days. Been in the world for many days. Precaution, precarious world. 28%. This is not a fishing rod, is it? It's fishing rod. Mr. Dubois, I hear the meeting with Titus was a glowing success. That's such a relief. Titus can be a handful sometimes. Now, what can Everett Claire do for you today? We can say, I've just finished investigating the local drug trade. 
Ah, yes, your side investigation, thank you. He adjusts his glasses. You've got some spirit clearing up that phony drug accusation along this, alongside this murder. I'll talk to the mayor and see if I can get you the key to the city, Harry. Now, let's talk some real business. He refuses to discuss it further. It's probably just a small nuisance to him. Not even a speck of anger in his voice. That's that, then. Well, I may have changed my mind about getting those signatures. You bring joy to my heart, Harry. Such a pleasure to be working with you here. He hands us an open white envelope. You need to get signatures from Isabel Sadie and Lillian Carter. The cul-de-sac is right past the pawn shop and across the, the canal. I heard there was some trouble with the water lock, but it should be fixed now. Isabel Sadie and Lillian Carter in a cul-de-sac right past the pawn shop. Once you have the signatures, mail this to 1322 La Roca in La Delta. Then we can talk about your gun. He runs his fingers through his thin ha ha uh, hair. Oh, uh, we could try to lie. I mailed the signatures you asked me to get. <laughs> I think he's probably going to figure out that we didn't do that. So, all right, let's go get signatures. Gosh, how do I get out of here? A white envelope with a stamp attached to the upper right corner handed to you by Everard Clare. Inside are some legal documents with two names printed on them, Isabel Sadie and Lillian Carter. Both signatures are required. Ooh. You take the legal documents out of the envelope in a 1240 month construction period and the zoning plan in the addendum. We can look at the zoning plan. The youth center cuts into the ocean like the bow of some great modern ship. Apparently, it's going to cover most, if not all, of the street and the square between the existing houses. It's three stories tall. It's going to be awfully close to the already existing buildings, almost wall-to-wall, -wall, practically integrating them into the youth center. This is either ominous or cool architectural choice. Hard to tell. Kim, what do you think of this, we can say? I'm no property lawyer, but it looks fine, the lieutenant replies, flipping through the documents. I like the print size. They're not selling or leasing anything. It's not a perfect solution, but any shrugs. How else are you going to build something? It's always inconvenient to build things, and citizens inevitably have disagreements over such construction projects, but there's no other way. <sighs> Logic. Let's put the documents back in the envelope. I can pass a logic check, I believe. I've got lots of logic gear. Logic. Logic. No, 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 no. Yes, logic. Yes! Logic! Oh, that's plus two to logic. Oh, I get a net of one to logic there. But I lose out on perception. No, 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 no. Four to logic. Okay, let's do this again. If I don't get a good shot now. 92% to find a loophole in the deal. There is no loophole. The simple truth is the current residents are going to lose their street access, and for the next 12 to 40 months, their lives will be dominated by constant construction noise right next door. Wait, what are the ramifications of this, we can say? Once the construction starts, it'll probably take a few months, a year maybe, for even the most stubborn occupants to get tired of living like this. After that, they'll sell their property for cheap and move on out. Look, Kim, and we can point to the photocopy. These people are going to have to move away. Can we do something about it? I should have seen it, says Kim. The lieutenant frowns as he reads over the document again. 
Everard probably has eyes on us, but he pauses to think we could try to get other people to sign this instead of those listed, or you could forge their signatures yourself. By the time he finds out, we'll already be gone. Oh! Everard's people could be watching us here. Where would we go to be free of Everard's people? In the whirling and rags, maybe? Maybe in our little shack? We can look at the zoning plan again. Put the document back in the envelope. Oh. Let me put my perception gear back on. What if we go inside? Are Everard's people watching us inside this building? The FBI agent says the church. Oh, is that the sound well? Is that the only place where I can't be seen? Wow, people are, they're watching me even here. Okay. I'm really curious about the dialogue choices we get if we talk to the people at the cul-de-sac. I don't really want to get him to sign it, but I do kind of want to see what they would say. All right, uh, well, let's go to the church and let's open up the document there. We've got that dialogue check with Joyce that we need to uh, try again. And we've got to talk with Egghead about music. Oh, was it over here? Okay, let's go to the church. If we stand right on that spot. Actually, let's go to Joyce first. Where's her yacht? The trap is full of locusts, but they seem weak and unhealthy. A few lie on their backs with their legs twitching. Still no phasmid. 
poor things, says Empathy. <laughs> I wonder if we'll ever find a Phasmid. Okay, where's your yacht, Joyce? I keep forgetting. Ah, oh, that's right, up here. You're back. Good. What can I help you with? Still 3%. Well, it's, it's, it's not even, huh. Well, then what was the point of reading that book? There is a washerwoman check, isn't there? Our tenant, the policeman. Ah. I hope the waves don't keep you up at night. What can I help you with? We can ask her. I was asked to get your signature. And we can hand her the envelope. Aye, what's this about? She takes out the documents and squints her eyes. Come now, I can't read all this scribble. Tell me what it says. Everard wants to turn part of the village into a little youth center. And the rest are all being vague, so let's tell her the truth. She says, ha! She lifts the paper very close to her face and studies it intently. I might be half blind, but it looks like part of the village is going to be a street. The best part. The part we need to get out of our houses. Have you asked Lillian about this? I won't even consider signing until I know she's on board. And she hands the envelope back. Okay, let's ask her. Aye, the sea's gonna calm down soon, I can feel it. The wind is turning southeast. What's on your mind, officer? Why does she care about the waves so much? What's with, uh, what is it with you and the waves, we can ask? What is it with waves and fishermen? She tilts her head and looks at the sea. We need to be out there with them, fishing, making a living. So I ask them to accommodate me. But until that happens, I can try to assist you the best I can, she adds with a smile. So what'll it be, officer? We could try for the date again, but Kim is with us. And we need better suggestion. I was asked to get your signature. We can hand her the envelope. Were you? Her eyes dart back and forth on the paper. Hmm. This says, by signing, I agree to living with construction ways. What exactly is the union building? Everart is planning to turn some of the village into a youth center. What a nice idea. Wouldn't have thought of that. Her voice trails off. She sounds incredulous about the niceness of the idea. Thought what exactly, we can say. And she says that Everart and the Union have, a nice, pl have nice plans for everything. I thought they only cared about themselves. She shakes her head. Well, I guess Union members have children too. And those members have a vote when electing the head of the local chapter. Okay, instead of giving her our pen, we can say, don't sign the papers. Aye, if you say so, she plucks on her net. Probably better that way. I mean, who likes construction noise? All right. So let's see if going into the shack keeps us safe from his prying eyes. Even interfacing. I have good interfacing gear, I think. Interfacing plus one. Is that it? Is that just one? Oh, don't tell me I'm going to have to convince these poor people.
It's a red check I can only try once. That's it. Vladimir says, Ox, reread the pale book, Ginger, Bark Tea, Ginseng. Also, it has recommendations on how to stay healthy with the pale, which you missed. Okay. General health advice. Have you taken any walks through the pale uh, recently? I don't even know what this pale thing is. How could I have walked through it? The book is frustratingly vague on the topic. Okay, so let's try... Maybe? And on your walks, do you stop to meditate on the nature of your being? Totally, every time. Good. And when you meditate, are you in the nude? Oh yeah, buck naked. Excellent. Free your body! You long to feel the cool breeze tickle against your inner thigh and midriff. You're doing everything as you should. Regular pale meditation has been shown to help keep your body lithe and strong, your mind alert and expansive. A note of caution, however, be sure to limit your exposure to the pale to no more than an hour a day and no more than three hours total per week. Okay, we can try to do... Vladimir says ginger, bark tea, and then ginseng. But I'm getting the same... I think it's a bug. I'm getting a tincture of whiskey and ginger. That's it. Seventy-two. How about items? Oh. You mean tools? I mean, I could take speed. <laughs> I could take speed, and that'll give me plus one to Motorix. But I think I mean I made an agreement with myself to not do this anymore, right? I was okay with smoking the cigarettes, but I don't think I want to take speed. Check success! With a confident flourish, we complete our forgery. What do you see on this signature line? Two names, Isabel Sadie and Lillian Carter. Indeed, they look distinctly different and very convincing. These might as well be their actual signatures, but they're not, and the document will be nullified if they dispute it. That means Everart will have to start over. All you need to do now is mail the signatures to Everart's accountant in La Delta. There was a mail delivery box in the plaza near the corner of the bookstore. All right. We did it. Whoo. Okay. Wait, while I'm here, I might as well do the church stuff, right? Well, no, I'll, I'll, I'll get my gun.
I knew we'd get to use this mailbox for something other than kicking, says Kim, and we can drop the white envelope into the mailbox. You drop the white envelope into the darkness, it lands with a soft thud on what sounds like a couple of letters. About a week's worth of mail has collected in there. They'll empty this very soon. Probably did the right thing. You can trust that slug Everart. You know he's going to play you somehow. All right, let's go back to Everart. The lieutenant turns towards the industrial harbor. If we don't mention anything to him, he won't know before it's too late. Kukabet says, making this is far worse than getting the real signatures. They are now bound without knowing it. You're a monster, Ox. No, the reason this is better is because they are fake, which means that if they challenge it, which they will, Everard's entire empire collapses. His ability to, well, not, his, his empire doesn't collapse. That's a big rant. But his ability to build the buildings collapses. He won't be able to build them. So this is their only way out of it. All right, let's get our gun. Mr. Dubois, a pleasure as always. You don't have to sit down this time since you're already sat on that chair. Oh, and did he not like it when I sat in the chair? It's done, I mailed the signatures as you asked. The golden boy returns once more. Wonderful, simply wonderful, Harry. He claps his hands together like a child who's just been offered cotton candy. Of course, I already knew this. And we gain 70 experience. My friend, the mailman, confirms the letters is on its way. You've done a great thing today. You've given the children of Martinez a real future, Harry. And I feel I can finally trust you now. You're in my inner circle. You too, Mr. Kitsuragi. He nods to the lieutenant, smiling broadly. We can talk about anything. The strike, the murder... Your lost gun. Nothing is off the table. See, forging that signature really paid off. Um, should we say... <laughs> let's not mention the fact that we know he wants to force them out with construction noise. Because then he'll start to become suspicious about whether or not we forge. So let's get our gun now. Harry, I've got to be honest with you, he turned solemn. Your gun was found two days ago. Withholding this information weighed heavily on me, but it had to be done. You bastard! Your gun is with an old woman, he says, absolutely unperturbed by your outbursts. If she is a character, or I hear she's a character, so watch out. This must be the woman who bought the gun from Roy, the one he described as terrifying. So the gun is still with the woman who bought it from Roy? Yes, the same. I see you've done your research. The pawn shop made the gun easy to track. He smiles and shakes his head in wonderment. Crazy stuff, Harry, selling your gun like that. Wild. Anyway, union boys are going to help you fix it, he winks at you. Don't worry, Harry. The neighbors of this old woman contacted my men because they trust me and the Debwadares union. Apparently she was waving it around at the entrance to her building. Waving the gun around doesn't sound good. None of this does. She was waving it around at people? As I said, she is a character. I didn't have time for details, he smiles. It sounds like she's unstable, but don't worry, no one got hurt. Who is this old woman? Unfortunately, I don't know anymore, he says. You're gonna have to go blind, Harry, but she's an old lady. How dangerous can she possibly be? Oh, and she calls herself Pigs. There it is again, the Pigs, like Roy said, not good at all. I, for one, find it refreshing, says Kim. 
Finally, someone calls themselves a pig. A smile flickers in the corner of his mouth. It actually sounds extremely bad, but let's not give him the satisfaction. Can you set up a meeting, we can say? And he says, I already have. He holds out his index finger. Oh, tonight, starting at 2200, near the old fish market on the coast. The one on the boardwalk. Oh, God. A little past the fishing village. Be careful, Harry. I would never set you up for anything dangerous, but you did ask for this. Now, he claps, clasps his hands. Back to the fun stuff. She will be there from 2200 to 2. On the boardwalk. Near the old fish market. A little past the fishing village. Kim says, more fun stuff. He looks at you. Seems like we already have fun stuff to do. Did you order the hanged man killed? Order it? You know my man didn't kill him. They told you. It was a happy accident. You know how it is. No one takes the initiative. If I wanted him dead, I would have had to do it myself, and I'm too fat for that. <laughs> Why are you so fat? Well, I'm glad you've asked. I've got type 2 diabetes because sugar and fat was all my mother had to give me and my brother Edgar when we were kids. He waves his finger at you. Good job, too, as it made me ugly. And ugly people, Harry, are much better at politics. That is true. People don't trust pretty people. What did you gain from him being dead, we can ask? Why, a war, of course, says Everard. And what do you have to gain from a war? Victory, Mr. Kitsuragi. I have victory to gain. We are going to start a war with the Wild Pines Group and win before they even realize there is a war. But they are trained military people. Aren't you afraid for your men? Harry, we outnumber them 1,500 to one. And that's just Martinez. With all the unions and Revachol, and with public opinion on our side, we can hold off two men, or 15 men, or even 50 men. The more they send, the worse it's going to look for them. They made a huge mistake hiring those guys. No one likes foreign mercenaries. The leftists hate them. The fascists hate them. Even the moralists think they're in bad taste. How is this connected to the strike, we can say? Harry, there is no strike, only war, class war, or in business terms, a drawn raid. Or wait, he pauses to rub his chin. Is that when you still pay them something? Because we won't do that. We're not going to give nothing. We're going to take Terminal B away from them. The roads, the gates, the containers, that big crane, even the damn coffee maker. We're going to take all of it for the people. And screw wild pines. The word screw rings like a gunshot from his mouth. He doesn't swear often. So that's why you haven't... Let Joyce in, says Kim. Yes, says Everard. It's also why I let that midget Gaumont, uh, Gaumont go. He's too nice. I can't put him through this. Plus, he knows how to get in here. That woman can't tell her, her wow from her wow. She has no chance. What? We can say? Wow from her wow. It's a local say. Why? Actually, no, it's not, says Rhetoric. Well, why are you telling me your plans? Because we're friends, Harry, says Everard. Besides, it doesn't matter now. You can go tell her if you want. It won't change the course of events. We have a significant head start. He looks at the swordfish clock and nods. It's already happening. So who killed the hanged man? No idea, says Everard. Could have been his own mother for all I know. If you ever find the guy, give him a big fat kiss from Everard. Claire couldn't have done it without him. Ranker says, Steam says that Visage made major updates since early access, so it might be worth to play it through them live again, even if it might be similar. Maybe. I mean, if people are interested enough, I can start from the beginning. A guy, huh? Says Reaction Speed. How do you know it's a guy, we can say? I don't, says Everart. I told you it could have been his own mother. I'm pretty sure it wasn't uh, anyone from the Union. Maybe it was the mob, or maybe he killed himself. Because he was a closet socialist? Truth is, I simply don't know. How many of you guys are there in the Union, we can say? 2,372, he replies like a whip. Plus, yours truly, of course. So, 2,373 is a sizable contingent for a lab labor organization in Revachal. And they're all well motivated. At least the ones we've seen. How are you going to fund your new independent harbor? 
Oh, you mean what sort of goods are going to be flowing through? How am I going to replace all of the contracts we'll lose once the poo-poo hits the fan? The clients who'll ditch us? Harry, we've thought of everything. Everything? Well, but, uh, we've been running back... Uh, running back channel negotiations with all the major clients. I think the company will be unpleasantly surprised to see how many of them stay loyal to Martinez and to the new competitive contracts we can offer. With renewed zeal sparked by communal ownership, the men will be shipping those containers double time. You'll be surprised to see how fast things go without parasites latching on. We've, we'll have our hands free to pursue, to pursue bold exotic new revenue streams. That's drugs, says Reaction Speed. Drug trafficking, says Kim. Drug trafficking, says Everard. Don't be stupid, Mr. Kitsuragi. There are perfectly legal, 100% ethical chemical factories on the Samaran Izola. You don't need to be col a colonialist about it. All they do is produce components to keep the pharmaceutical industry running. That's people's health we're talking about. Old grannies, little babies, people with disabilities. Hmm. That's just the tip of the iceberg, though, isn't it, we can say. And he says, the company thinks transporting these chemicals in bulk looks bad, he makes air quotes, has bad optics, may be illegal in some countries. The Debrodeers Union, however, we're all about the large volume column. We're going to transport the living daylights out of those materials, Harry, he slams his fists on the desk once more, so your sick kid can get his benefit, and your wacky uncle doesn't have to come off as Riz Perizol. And the kids on the street can get speed and uh, pure hold of them. I'm an old-fashioned guy, says Mr. says Everart, Mr. Kitsuragi. I sometimes grab a beer with the boys, but I have no idea about the things you just mentioned. And he smiles. But if I were to supply ingredients for some of the Rainbow Party, I would make sure the union took a fantastic share, and I'd keep that stuff far away from Martinez. Is Ruby helping you secure this fantastic share? Harry, if I was supplying raw materials to drug manufacturers, I need an army of rubies. The lieutenant nods slowly, understood. Ah, uh, lots of really interesting options, but they all sidetrack from our primary case, so I'm going to say interesting stuff. I just want to solve this murder, okay? You know why you're such a good detective, Harry? You don't get sidetracked, says Everard. You care about the people you're supposed to protect, not some systems that may or may not be unethical. Anyway, let's not focus on the sensationalism of the drug trade. This hypothetical drug trade is all anyone ever seems to be interested in. It would only be a small part of the harbor's turnover. Just like the harbor is but a small part of Martinez. It would still be illegal, we can say. Let's look at the big picture, says Everart. Martinez as a whole. There are little girls out there with dreams of making music, young mothers who want to start a business, models who want to walk catwalks, and steel welders who want to weld steel. I'm going to unite them all into one economic body. We're going to incorporate this place into ki uh, to kingdom come. Everyone's going to be in on the wealth, and everyone's going to pull their weight. Let's keep focusing on the drug trade. He was almost admitting to it. Oh. Well, if we pass the volition check, maybe we can say, hold on, I don't want to look at the big picture. I want to look at the drug trade you almost admitted to. And Everard says, no, no, Harry, that's boring. He says, all right, it's gone. The hypothetical raw materials trade is off the table. It's such a small and insignificant slice of revenue. I'm cutting it. Boys, he looks around the container. Harry felt queasy about it. We're not doing it. Can we talk about my beautiful incorporated Martinez and its many-sided business ventures now? This bold new vision of incorporated socialism I'm offering... I mean, none of these guys, uh, none of these options are really mine, but I guess I can say, well, I mean, if it has the word incorporate in it, then I like it. I'm a money guy. Yes, if you start thinking about it like that, the socialist municipal body sort, uh, sort of is like a corporation, isn't it? It used corporate law. We're incorporated. I like to think we're using the best parts of all the ideologies here, Harry. 
Can I ask you about specific union members? And he says, we're way past specific union members. This is big time. His eyes are shining. We're talking about the future of Revishal here, Harry. You can bother Leonard with that, he points to the door. He loves to run his mouth on such matters, but I'm big time mode, Harry. You know the signatures I got? I know you plan to force them out with the construction noise. Harry. He shakes his head. By now you should know I would never do anything tricky like that. However, if the construction noise and limited street access makes some people consider moving, well, let's just say there'll be freshly renovated buildings near the roundabout where those poor people can finally enjoy a significant uptick in quality of life. I'm talking real affordable workers' palaces. So the village is doomed, says Kim. The lieutenant says grimly, You were there, you saw the place, a wasteland. There's nothing left. But mark my words, officers, he slams his fist on the table, causing some of the coffee to spill. We are going to reset it. Reset, he repeats. I have big plans for Martinez, and they do not include humans living in those pig sheds on the coast. That land will be used for municipal buildings and commerce. Well, what do you mean? Harry, imagine a youth center supermarket church complex employing hundreds, no thousands of people. The coast will be lit up with enterprise and life. All those ruins out there turned into low-income housing. He leans forward. Harry, enough is enough. We're talking the dis we're taking the district back. The war was 50 years ago for God's sake. It's time to move on, move on. Youth supermarket church complex? Do you really expect me to believe that we can say? And he says, yes, I do. I got the center. I got room for a retail complex. And in four years, I'll get the church too. The wheels are already turning, Harry. The wheels of progress. This post-war limbo, I won't stand for it. There are kids practically playing with their own feces out there. It cannot go on. There is true indignation in his voice when he speaks about the state of things, and even a touch of pain. The pain is true. He's seen the kids do worse than that. I knew you were up to something, we can say, and he goes, damn right, I'm up to something, Harry. The fist lands on the table again. I'm gonna make the working man as rich as Joyce Messier. That's my job, just like yours is, to keep the peace. A true flash of anger in him, as he thinks of her. Well, that's it for now. We can conclude. Great, Harry. Great. I think we have truly built a bridge between Martinez and Jamrock today. We have united the RCM and the Debwaders Union. Suddenly, there's sadness in his tone. This, he points to you, then to himself, has been so great. I'm sorry we don't have more fun things to do together. But if you ever feel like bouncing something off of me, my door is always open. A few more questions about the harbor we can ask, but that's actually it. We've completed everything we need to do with Everart Claire. Nineteen thirty seven. We're going to be meeting them at ten o'clock and it's seven forty. That gives us a few hours to go to the church to see what has changed there. After all, remember, now we have the tape for Egghead. I mean, if the thumbnail of the stream is too distracting, I can take a moment to try and fix it. I mean, it'll take me like five minutes. I'd, I'd rather not pause the stream to try and fix it. But if it's that, that distracting for people, I can try. Wait, didn't you say we could ask him about people? Hola, wandering man. How can I help you? That weasel I visited. Turns out he has one hell of a colonial mug collection. Yeah, he nods, rubbing his chin. The janitor who gave me the key to his apartment said the guy's a bit of an asshole.
Yes, his mug collection certainly represented antiquated social values. Like I said before, I don't know much about this weasel, but the boss man said he's a real piece of work. He touches his beret. Thanks for helping out, friend. All right. So that's the individual we can talk with. We need to go to the bunker as well to fail that check because chat says, Vladimir says that it's going to make things easier for us later on. You should come back here when it snows. A strange feeling. It passes quickly. Oh. I should come back here when it snows? Okay, will do. Just outside the church. Looks like I can't give this figurine to her. Why? Because she's a stained glass window. That doesn't seem to be a problem. Maybe you meant something else? Like what? Is the task still on? I don't know. What are we thinking of? Part of your mind has gone on to other things already. Only a strange little sadness remains. Cold wind blows from the broken gallery, making our skin crawl. And that's a deal! Yeah! Medium car! The words echo magnificently throughout the nave. Hey, Egghead, I found this reel of tape. Maybe you can use it to, to hard up Ike's jam, and we can give him the fixed Hawthorne Reed tape, or free tape. Yeah! Remix time! His voice booms through the church as he takes the tape and attaches it to the empty reel slot. Tape goes here into deck B. He clicks a switch. The tape starts spinning. A hand on his ear. He listens to the audio through his headphones and shouts. Wow. His face lights up with delight. Did you get this from Arno himself? A great excitement is bubbling to the surface within him. This is big. No, actually, I found it tangled up in a hawthorn tree. Listen, I'm just going to show, show it to you, all right? Ready? Ready. Whoa, hear that? He wipes his brow. The signs match perfectly. Now, if only we had the beat for the full assault, it would be unbelievably hyper. What is this? Says Asselle. She looks up from her contact mic. It's good. How did you guys do that? <laughs> You're right, we can say. It is uncanny how well it all goes together. Something else must be going on here. And Andre says, yes, but what if Van Eyck based his remix on some forgotten local melody, like a folk song? And you just found the original piece that inspired him to create his jam. That would explain why it fits so well. 
And Assel says, nah, to me it sounds like classic Van Eyck. I don't think he needs any inspiration from folk songs. Maybe he lives in Martinez and just threw away a part of his song because he thought it wasn't good enough. And Noid says, I think it's just happenstance, chaos in action, contingencies of our limited existence, that and Egghead's fantastic talent. He nods to his friend behind the turntables. Noid's right, Egghead's technical talent is the key. No, this is definitely part of the same song. Something cut from it. It fits too well. Something mysterious is going on here. Well, um... Let's, let's go with Noid, I guess. And we gain a thought. Uh, Arno Van Eyck, Eyck, be how it may, if it fits, it fits. He pumps his fists into the air. Bring up the volume. What about the bass? Do you have any idea for that? Andre looks back at you. Yeah, I remember. You said it needs more bass. I think you might know the answer. Ooh. What if we use that crazy sound assault from Suna's experiment, but contained, tamed it, made it pulse? Ooh, ooh! Egghead's puzzled face turns into a wicked grin, but how? What about that compressor Andre was setting up to achieve some sort of parallel processing? Don't be too hard on yourself if you don't figure it out, says Andre. I think the jam's already pretty ultra, but it could be hyper, hyper hardcore, says Egghead. It's a godly check. The audio onslaught can be tamed. Connect the dots. Well, let's talk to Andre. Oh, hey, man. It's good to see you. Oh, it's a composure check, and it's still 3%. Let's get our hat back from a cell. Welcome back. Uh, jeez, I'm not finding an option to get the hat back. And then that just loops us back into the dialogue tree we had earlier. All right, maybe it's because I need to to increase my reaction speed to catch the silver bird. Well, let's try Noid again. Yo, man, what's on your mind? Now, so let's talk to Suna. Yes, what is it? So I've still got this pale unknown thing. We've heard of the doomed commercial area. We investigated the doomed commercial area, but we've got this negative 10 for the pale unknown. <gasps> Medicinal purposes of the pale. So did I, is, is there a glitch? Ginger root, tea, birch bark, ginseng. Nope. <sighs> no. Uh, I think it's glitched. Hey man, it's good to see you. 
Now that was a composure check, but I don't think I have enough composure gear. One. Yep, yeah, just that one. Oh! Composure two! Oh, hey man, it's good to see you! 8%. It only raises it to 8%. Uh, in Collectio says, Pale can become known by talking to Joyce or what's her name on the boat. Yeah, I tried that, but I, I keep failing. Like, it's, it's only got, it's giving me a 3%. This is only an All right, let's go to the bunker. You rattle the handle a bit and then push the door with all of your weight. It does not budge. The and not only is it locked, it's also jammed shut. Huh, the door's shut tight. How can we get in there? The lieutenant shrugs. We don't get in there. Well, what do you mean? We get into, like, everywhere. Frankly, you're just going to have to accept the fact that you can't get in through every single door, says Kim. No, no, no. We've gotten into every door thus far. That's what we do. We open doors. We're cops. That's our perk. Even Everart knew that's part of our M.O., but that's who I am, who we are, we can say. And Kim says, yeah, I understand you. I like opening doors as much as the next guy, but this one is simply beyond repair and we don't have the resources needed to open it. And we gain five experience. Relax, no one's hiding in there. If we can't open it, no one can, others can't either. And thus, they can't get in. He looks at the door with a rueful smile and we can walk away. Vladimir says, talk to Joyce now. You need to pass that fundamental check. Thought Jamas Vu adds big bonus. If chance is low, save reload is your only option. Or, I mean, I, I'd hate to get through the game by just fudging all of the dice rolls. Which is why I haven't been saving and reloading each and every time. Plus, for a 3% chance, that would take forever. But I'll go back to Joyce. I mean, I am suffering from a glitch, so maybe that has something to do with it. You're back. Good. What can I help you with? Conceptualization. I've got composure, but not conce... Oh, here we go. Plus one to conceptualization.
plus two to conceptualization. Then what if I... All of these hurt my morale. I need something that improves my intelligence, like cigarettes. I could, I could go buy some cigarettes. You're back, good. What can I help you with? That still brings it up to 3%. I just added two points to my conceptualization and it's still only at 3%. Sarge Gamer says 3% is impossible. It can't be done. Yeah. I mean, I'll try it. All right, well, I'm not going to worry about it. But um, I do want to get my gun back and that's in one hour. So is there a, bun a bench I can wait at? Danko, Danko. Tequila Sunset. I don't want to give him the blue medicinal spirit. I might need that for something. Oh, Kim is trying to talk to me. I've been meaning to have a little chat with you about your sense of style. My style? What about it? It's, well, a little eclectic, don't you think? How would you even describe what you're wearing? Ooh. Eclectic is for pop music with indigenous percussion, your sertorial maverick. Formal apologetic, hobo chic, Superstar casual, regular core, office harbinger. Oh, we're going superstar casual. Well, I can't say it doesn't fit you. Still, you might try branching out a little. You know, the expression, the clothes make the man, the right outfit in the right situation can make all the difference in the world. Uh... <laughs> I'm not taking style tips from someone dressed like a mega bino clard. Or we can say, okay, you're a sharp-dressed man. We could be style buddies. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, detective, says Kim. A warm smile. Anyway, we should probably get back to the case. Let's go. Style buddies. <laughs> That's what he wanted to talk with me about. He wanted to talk about my personal style. Uh, we can sit on, sit on benches after we've solved the murder. Let's go. You can revisit a bench if you ever need to pass the time when the Lieutenant Kitsuragi is gone. So he won't sit with me? Ah, uh, I just need to pass one hour. So I can go get my gun. That's a logic check of godly. I could go to the Feld Mural again, but that's an impossible shivers check. The wash basin, hand-eye coordination, medium. Where's the wash basin? Is it inside the house?
Who's humming? Oh, it's the little girl. There's no wash basin here. Durag says, read the ledger. It passes the time. All right, I can do that. But my map is telling me that there's a wash basin with a check that I could probably pass. This is the only wash bas basin I see. Our tenant, the policeman. I hope the waves don't keep you up at night. What can I help you with? Is it in here? No. Weird Beard says, wasn't there a wash basin in your room in the shack, the one you shaved in? I mean, that's where I just, I just checked that out. And it's not that. But it says wash basin, and it's right here, which is weird. Hand-eye coordination check. Everything else is, and the warded door, that's another one that I can't find. The wash basin and the warded door. The rest of these are all godly or impossible. Andre's is impossible. Joyce's is impossible. Confront pigs to get my gun back. This is what I need to do afterwards. Check the boardwalk and check the island for bullet traces. Land's End, Boardwalk, or Island. Okay, so we can go to the Boardwalk. Where's the island? Here. How do we get to the island? Oh, I've got to go through here. So let's go to the Boardwalk. We'll do that at 10 o'clock. I've got the spirit, and I'm going to hold on to it until I get the signal. So I sold the murder weapon, so I'll never be able to complete this. And I still haven't drunk any booze. All right. Uh, so reading the journal can pass time. Okay, so let's read the journal or the ledger. We can smell the, the ledger. The acidic stench of rotting food has rubbed off on the cellulose. It now forms the base of the experience. This base, surrounded by a faint air of spoiled meat, the stuff of death itself, and then sprinkled liberally with the citrus zest of toilet cleanser. You know, like the bits they put in, in the into public piss bowls, probably called Fermi Discreet or Axel or something. At some point in its journey, the ledger has seen the inside of a public toilet. I know, I know. Sylvie already told me I dunked it in the toilet. If you knew it was dunked in the toilet before getting chucked into the trash, why are you sniffing it? <laughs> well, the option to sniff it was there, so... So you wanted to get in on the trash toilet stink collab? Find out what happens when those two get funky together? Okay, pal. This is getting weird and hostile. Sorry, Nose. Let's just move on. Or, are you angry with me, Nose? Yeah, it turns out your nose doesn't like self-indulgent literal crap huffing. Quelle screwing surprise. Come on, no more. 
The ledger is going back now, away from your nose. Um, so the reason uh, I haven't tried to internalize any of these other thoughts is because I have them all filled up. These are the ones that I could internalize, including this new one, the Arno Van Eyck. This is the one you guys want me to do, but I can't yet because I don't have any open slots. Yes. Lieutenant, I have a confession to make. I am the murderer. The lieutenant appears unfazed, and what has led you to this conclusion? My chest feels hollow, like I did something terrible. That is a common side effect of overindulgence. It will pass. So you're saying I didn't kill him? But Kim, it turns out, turned out to be that I was the one racing around town in my motor carriage. He purses his lips. The victim wasn't run over by a drunk driver, so while I can't condone your driving habits, the case remains unrelated. Look, it's not unusual for detectives to feel complicit in the crimes until the perpetrator is identified and apprehended, especially when the investigation is dragging. So let's get back to it, shall we? He just wants to get back to it. Now that we've inspected the scene, I want to know more about this pissing competition you mentioned. What's there to say? Uh, what is there to say? It's just stu stupidity. What kind of stupidity? The cop kind. Our precincts can't decide if Martinez is part of Jamrock or the Industrial Harbor. Yours or mine, as if we somehow own parts of this city. Typical street gang mentality. So we've let the union make a mockery of law enforcement here, and now it comes to its natural conclusion. Ah, so this is a struggle over who runs Martinez. Well, sort of. It's less a matter of who gets to police Martinez than who has to. It's an orphan district, in other words. I think the dispatch desk just told both our stations about the hanging. There was quite the brouhaha at the 57th, I can tell you that. Time to settle it, they said. Cop off. But... He leans in. I assure you, I am not their finest or toughest with 102 cases solved. What I am is least interested in a pissing competition. So he volunteered to represent the 57th, but not out of competitiveness. On the contrary. So you volunteered to spoil it, we can say. And he says, yes. I'm an unrepentant spoil sport. The lieutenant appears pleased with this. What's special about Martinez? Martinez, he says? Nothing. It's just a puddle at the end of some drain pipe. No one cares about this place. They care about sports. Most of our colleagues don't even know how to get here. North of the interchange doesn't exist. A tremble comes over us. Another after effect of ethanol poisoning, perhaps. Feels like leaves do when they rustle in the breeze. Somewhere far away below the turbine, the 41st uh, first and the 57th, the lieutenant was right. It's not about who gets what's north, it's about who doesn't. Well, I wonder what this says about me. That I was sent by my station? Hmm, he raises an eyebrow, thinking it's best to let you make the next, next move. Wow. Six options. One, I was sent to teach you a lesson in style. Two, there can only be one conclusion. I am the finest we have, a hero cop sent to outperform you in every way imaginable. Three, I must be an augury, an, ap an, an apocalyptic omen sent by my people. Can you guess my message? Or four, don't be scared, but I think I might have supernatural abilities. Or five, I probably have an unbelievable kill count. Or six, I'm gonna leave why I sent, why I was sent unspecified. Let's go with 
augury. Can you guess my message? And he goes, no. <laughs> well, better not to relay it, we can say. <clears throat> and he says, I agree, too dark. Well, he knows that the message means that that uh, it's too dark. Well, let's see what the other ones are. I am the finest we have. A good joke, says Kim. He does not actually think that it was a good joke. We could say, okay, it was a poor joke, but we could use a good-mannered cop-off, don't you agree? If it helps you work better, okay. See it as a competition, but don't expect me to. Now, was there anything else you wanted to talk about? And we gained 10, 10 experience. Okay, enough of the competition then. Tell me something else. And he says, yes, it is wholly point, a wholly pointless matter. Forget I even mentioned it. Ooh, and now we can pass a new check. Logic formidable. Why did the 41st send me? I'm probably already wearing all of my logic gear, but just to double check. It's only 42% right now. I've got one more, don't I? Because that's a logic plus three. If I can bump that up. Plus two to logic. Oh yeah, logic plus four. And that's logic plus one. Well, that's the hat that I was wearing. And that's it. Guess try again. Yes. 72%. Hey, look at you. It's because you're a failure. They sent you to slight precinct 57. What? No, that can't be right, we can say. But logic says, just think about it for a second. You're a raging alcoholic who showed up three days late and argues with his necktie. You weren't sent here to win. Kim, we can say, what if my precinct sent me on this case because I'm a screw-up? Like, as a joke? I've considered it, says Kim. His voice is somber. So it's true. It would be immeasurably ugly of them, not to mention unprofessional, but I also think it's somewhat unlikely. Why is that, we can say? And Kim says, I checked the records. This jurisdiction dispute, who polices Martinez, reaches back to the 30s. It's as old as my station. And all this time, we can't decide who gets Martinez? I think, yes, both stations would prefer to win. So you really see me as a safe bet, we can say. And Kim says, safe? No. But you're old. <laughs> You've made it this far. Something has brought you through. We've only just started working together, so I don't know what it is yet, but it's there. And we gain five experience. So no, I don't think they sent you as a joke. And even if they did, they are in for a surprise. And that heals our morale. He's right. There are no airtight theories, just paranoia. You've given it some thought. Now let it go. All right. And I think I can level up. Let's see if we can get this rhetoric cap up so that we can get rid of one of our thoughts. And that's it. Oh, one more under rhetoric. Now that we've leveled up, we can try the cargo door container again. Might as well. I mean, we've got one hour to wait before she arrives at the dock. Let's put all my rhetoric gear on again. I 
I've just been so unlucky with this doggone cargo door. Okay, I've got one to rhetoric. I just added a new point to rhetoric. That's two points added to my rhetoric. Let's try the cargo door. And hopefully enough time passes that when we come back, um, the pig lady will be there so we can finally get our gun back. And then once we have our gun back, we can finally go into the building, the Feld building. And that, I think, will allow us to get into the bunker. That's why I think we had to check that door. There's probably an underground tunnel that we can find that leads to the bunker, which leads to the small island where we need to look for more bullet holes. Wait, do I have any tear that I can sell? Nope. Wasn't there a jacket for sale here? Yeah. Oh, those are croissants. Did I already get the jacket? I must have already gotten the jacket. Um, is this about the questions again? Cause no. All right, let's go to the container. All right, one pint down. Pint two. There we go. Okay, Rhetoric, don't fail me now. Like you failed me so many times before. Jocelyn, with a donation of stars. Thank you, Jocelyn. She says, Superstar Cop Mondays, keeping it hardcore. Hardcore. Thank you, Jocelyn. Forty two percent. Ooh, I got one for precarious world. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I'll try it again. Ah, got it. Stupid shipping container. Ivan says, Ox, go check the security box on top of the wall again. Security box? On top of the wall? I don't know what you mean by that. A security box on top of the wall. Uh, let's see. That's a composure check. I can't try that again. Yeah, the rest are all way too difficult. We've got to confront pigs. That's at 2,200. Let's 
Security box on the wall. This? That's the punching clock. There's this, but that's volition. And my volition hasn't changed at all. Ivan says the security post near to where you are now. Okay, so the only security post was over here, but I don't recall there being a box north of your position. All right, I'll go, I'll go back there. That's where, what's his name, died. There's nothing here. Okay, let's go to the boardwalk, see if we can find those bullet holes. It's raining. I wish it would snow so I could go check out that one spot where I should come back when it starts snowing. Check the boardwalk for bullet traces.
Well, wouldn't it be over here? If she was trying to shoot. I really wish time would uh, go by when I'm not talking to somebody. So this is where I need to go to move on. Oh, how do I get over there? This section of the coast hasn't been used in decades. This is where the people were executed. Now that I have that quest available, do I get a new dialogue by checking this out? Nope, still in the vis visual calculus. Okay. Ox, read a book. All right, yeah, I can definitely read a book. Yeah, that starts to pass the time. Great. Well, I'm going to use this opportunity for a bio break. Be right back. And then hopefully enough time will have passed and we can go meet our pig lady.
Oh, wow. Wow, time really jumped through. <laughs> okay, thank you for that, everybody. So time passage is relative to the amount of time it takes me to read something. Forty one, fifty six, twenty two hundred hours. Can't believe it was like that. I just had to find the right book. Well, there we go. She should be there now. Was that? Put your hands where I can see them. What the heck? The aging woman under the mountain of police paraphernalia mumbles to herself, then notices you and reaches for the megaphone. Show me your hands. This is the pigs. Show me your hands right now. Show me your hands right now. Scavenged battery-powered police lights protrude from her back. The flickering light show reveals a gun in her shaking hand. Her hand is trembling from some sort of neurodegenerative disease. Madame, please drop the firearm immediately. Oh, Kim pulls out a piece. You shouldn't be here. Something's very wrong with her. She's completely out of control. Uh, it's just a standard flashlight, ma'am. Calm down. Failure to comply. Suspect is displaying aggression. Officer under duress. Officer under duress. I am the police. Don't move. Don't move. Hands on your head. Suspect is armed and dangerous. Ma'am, I need you to calm down. We just want to talk. Lateral vascular neck restraint. Carotid sleeper. Carotid sleeper. Critically reducing blood from passing through the neck of the suspect. Be careful, detective. Don't do anything that might set her off. I mean, he's, he's the one with the gun drawn on her. I just have a flashlight. Oh, we could... We could try to pass a hand-eye coordination. Okay, we can solve this peacefully. Please lower the weapon. Officer in need of assistance. Her eyes dart between you and Kim. Suspect at large, get on the ground. Ma'am, please, says Kim. The lieutenant is trying to maintain eye contact. We want to help you, but you need to lower the weapon. Let's just talk, all right? Disturbance reported. Authorized deadly force. Sector, take the shot. Her head snaps at you. Big red key! Big red key! Please identify yourself, ma'am. It's the doggone police crap bag, she yells into the microphone. Hug the pavement, you're under arrest. As she waves her hand, we notice familiar-looking ampules and packets sticking out of the mountain of police gear on her back. Medicine or drugs? She thinks she's a police officer. Try treating her like a police officer. A lower-ranking police officer. Ah, here we go. Officer Piggs! Double your Freuter Harrier Dubois, requesting your sidearm for inspection, and we can hold out our badge. 
What? She lowers the megaphone and stares at the gun in her hand. Patrol officer, you are in gross violation of the RCM code of conduct. Sir, she hesitates, looking around in confusion. The three-barreled pepper box waves in her hand. Patrol officer, I have to sign you up for a disciplinary hearing. And we can slowly shake our head. Easy, says Kim, the lieutenant whispers. Press her too hard and she'll... With a swift, poorly coordinated move, the woman slams the megaphone against her lips and teeth. A trickle of blood runs down her chin. She doesn't notice it. Officer compromised. Unlawful impersonation. Pigs en route. Engage at will. Okay, she's actually more agitated now. My bad, says Suggestion. Oh, great. <laughs> but it increases our hand-eye coordination. Are you on drugs? Confiscated contraband. The megaphone makes her voice almost painfully metallic. Restricted access. Two kilos missing. Eyewitness report compromised. Kim says, I don't think she's on drugs, the lieutenant whispers. Being off drugs might actually be the problem here. You're not the police. We're the police. Back up? She lowers the megaphone halfway, but immediately raises it again and screams, Back up! Back up! Status unconfirmed! Uh... <laughs> uh, we can say, I'm Lieutenant W. Freuter, Harrier Dubois, 41st Precinct. This is my partner, Lieutenant Kitsuragi from the 57th. Or we could say, Baby, you know who I am. Everybody knows. And wink. Oh, that's what the superstar cop's gonna do. I do? The question is addressed to herself more than to you. Gareth? No, I. She raises the megaphone and screams, Aggravated assault! Man down! Suspect on foot! What's the situation? The lieutenant hesitates addressing the woman. Officer. Law enforcement compromised! She screams in the megaphone. Red and blue lights illuminating, a spit flying everywhere. Or the spit flying everywhere impersonating a police officer. And we pass a rhetoric check. Does she not believe you two are actually police officers? G-King says, Ox, the thumbnail is Witcher 3 on YouTube. Thanks very much for pointing it out. I already know it's one of those glitches that I haven't been able to fix yet. Well, we can get introspected and say, what if she's right and I really am an impersonator? Or we could say, we really are the cops. Look, my badge. Or first, let's try, look, white rectangles. License and registration. She repeatedly bashes the megaphone against her head, then screams in the bloody mouthpiece. License and registration. Come in, dispatch. Sector, sector, azimuth. It's not a code, just disjointed words. She's losing it. One twitch, and there will be blood. Well, we're gonna have to do it. Time to get my gun. Hey! All right, this is how we do it. You hurl the terror bag in her face, already darting right, and immediately close the distance. Left hand grabs the barrel. Right one breaks the wrist. Fingers lock behind her head. Knee to the face. Knee to the face. Crush the rib cage. Sidestep and drop her with the hammer kick. No, that won't be necessary. Look closer. The gun, all three barrels, red and blue lights shining through, it's not loaded. Well, it's... Let's see. Well, we could try to get her to pull the trigger. Let's see what Kim says first. Whisper, Kim, I'm almost certain there are no bullets in that gun. Huh? Says Kim. The lieutenant studies the swaying firearm. My God, I think you're right. Ma'am, the weapon you're holding is mine, and I know it has no bullets. What? The woman looks at the weapon in disbelief. Her eyes suddenly reddish with tears. She looks straight down the barrel and squeezes the trigger. Wait! A click. Nothing happens. She looks at the useless weapon. This isn't police issue. Police weapons have bullets. This isn't real. What is this? The gun lands on the... The gun lands on the wooden planks and, tear and tears run down her scratched cheeks. Police guns always have bullets. What is this? Why did you sell me this? Grab the gun right now. This might be your only chance. Let's pick up the gun. 
No one ever cares anymore. Her voice is growing fainter as she rocks back and forth slowly. Why would they cheat me like this? And we get our gun back. Poor woman, says Kim. The lieutenant holsters his pistol. We need to figure out what to do with her now. Nobody's ever around, the old woman mumbles, staring blank at the boardwalk. Nobody ever comes to visit me. Let's give her some sympathy. I'm very sorry this is how life turned out for you, and we can gently touch her shoulder. Her scratched skin is warm to the touch, but the person inside doesn't even know you're there. What do you think is happening to her, we can say? She's in stupor, the lieutenant replies, inspecting the catatonic woman standing in the dark. I've seen this before. God knows for how long. Could be days when they get like this. But why was she like this in the first place, we can say? Honestly, I don't know, says Kim. Dementia, probably. He lowers his voice. Dementia and Channel 8 and loneliness. We can nod and say neurodegenerative disease. And he says, could be, agrees the lieutenant. Her hands were trembling, and she did seem uncoordinated, but what are we going to do with her? Um, loneliness, we can say. Looks like a bad case. He gives the woman a compassionate look. But the question is, what do we do with her right now? Should we just arrest her? I don't think there's any need for that. In her current state, says Kim, and without the gun, she isn't really a threat to anyone. We could let Titus know. This is a perfect problem for the local peacekeepers to handle. They might even know her family. Um. Wait, I don't want to endorse the Hardy Boys' inflated sense of self-worth. Self-worth. They're not cops. We are. Uh... We can try that one. And he says, okay, that settles it. I'll contact my station after we wrap it up for the day. They can contact the sanitarium and handle the... Oh, wait, no, no, I don't want to do that. But I think we're done here for now. Let's head out. This is done. As you turn to leave, the faintest of voices comes from the woman. Please leave the radio on, she mutters. It seems like a reflex, a half-remembered sentence. <laughs> reflex to what? Being left alone? She stands motionless, just a heap of clothes and flashers now. Maybe if you search her once more. The woman stands slumped. She looks catatonic under her mountain of Ursium paraphernalia. Is one of those things a police cap? There were narcotics in there too. You're thinking of taking them too. We can pick up the Ursium cap. She doesn't even flinch as you reach out and disentangle the familiar-looking lieutenant's cap from her mountain of RCM paraphernalia. Oh, is that yours, says Kim? It's hard to say. It's been so long since you wore yours. <clears throat> Maybe. Probably. You know me. The lieutenant nods. It's your hat. We can confiscate the narcotics. Wink. Hey! You take the file of pyrohid... Uh, uh, Pyroholidian and the bottle of speed as evidence, obviously. She didn't consume them. She didn't look high. She confiscated them. A little like you're doing now. The lieutenant coughs. You're taking those, are you? Listen to him for once. Uh, fine. You take them, we can say. Thank you, says Kim, and he pockets the drugs. I'm doing this to help you. We need to focus on the case. <laughs> He's grateful that you did this. We can shake her shoulder. The old woman doesn't react to our touch. And we can leave. Hey, but I got a hat out of it. Yeah. Whoa, look at this. Where's the hat? Where's my new hat? There it is. Plus one to authority. RCM Lieutenant's Camp. Oh, yeah. He looks good in that hat. Of course, this one's way better. Well, I kind of regret not handing her over to the Hardy Boys. Though, maybe a sanatorium would be the best place. I mean, she's really out of it. All right, we got our gun. We haven't determined where the shot came from. We couldn't find any bullet traces on the boardwalk. Now we just need to look for Ruby on the coast. But first, we've got to go all the way back and uh, radio in uh, so that they can come and pick her up. Now, we've got a new tool, and it's our gun. Equip this item when times are most dire. A three-shot revolving barrel. Villers LaSalle Pepper Box. 
typical assi typically assigned to officers of the RCM upon reaching the rank of sergeant. The butt of the gun is worn, and engraved on the sides reads, Sunrise Parabellum. This is your gun, no doubt about it. Sunrise Parabellum. All right. Well, uh, okay. Well, before... Gosh, the day is going by so quickly. Um, let's go radio this in, and then maybe we should sleep. Get some a good night's sleep under our, our hat before we go into the building. How much time do I have? I've got an hour left. I was supposed to go into the building today, but I've, I've already exhausted an hour. Maybe we can step through the front door today before we have to go back. Big question is, how do I get ammo for this sucker? Whoops. Um, okay, well, we, we can say, I'm happy to report that I found my badge and began five experience. 10-4, sir, glad to hear that. I'll write down that there's no need to issue a new one to you then. Over. Feels good to get that off your chest, right? Celebration with beer? Listen, I've actually lost my gun too, we can say, and we gain five more experience. I know, I already wrote it in my report, but he hesitates. I will stay on my desk for a few days. And now we can say I've successfully located my 9mm Villiers pistol. It's on me now and I won't lose it again. And we gain a new skill point. All right. 10-4, sir. Roger that and very glad to hear it. I will make relevant changes to the report. Um... Okay, so then do we do we radio the Lazarus? How did you know it was me? We can say, and he says didn't, but now I do. How's the drinking going? Decided to stop completely forever. Great to hear. Stop by sometime when you're done with your case. I'll draw some blood, run it through, let you know how much forever your liver's gonna give you. All right. Uh, So we don't call it in. All right. Oh, I leveled up. I can finally max out rhetoric. Which means... Which means I could try the cargo container again, or I can finally get rid of advanced race theory. Oh, but it costs a skill point to forget. Uh, I gotta get one more skill point. All right, since I just, I just met my rhetoric cap, let's try Which, do I have my, do I still have my rhetoric clothes on? Let's try the container one more time. I do, I've got plus one to rhetoric. But don't I have plus two to rhetoric? Or am I thinking of uh, logic or encyclopedia?
Alright, cargo container one more time. Then we go back to the shack. Sleep off the night. Better pass it this time. Fifty eight percent. Vladimir says, once you have your gun, you can report to Everart and report about Everart's plans to Joyce to get experience in lore. Good one. Uh, good idea. Well, since we're here, we'll tell Everart that we got our gun back. Then we'll go to Joyce and tell Joyce about Everart's plans. Then we'll go sleep. Yes. Look, something forgotten on the coffee table. Where's the coffee table? Where's Everard? Well, why point out the coffee table when I can't interact with the coffee table? Okay, well, I can't go to Everart. Must be too late at night. Let's go check in with Joyce, see if she's there. It's snowing. Though it's not snowing hard. I wonder if we can still get it even though it's barely snowing. Well, let's check it out while it's still snowing. It was right in front of the church. here.
It was right here. And it's snowing. It must not be snowing hard enough. You're back. Good. What can I help you with? Mr. Reverard helped me find my gun. Stupendous, she nods, more than a bit surprised. I didn't think he'd pull through. <laughs> no need to flash my gun around. Let's just say I have it now. Thank God, and we can pat the gun. Thank God, and indeed, Mr. Everard as well. In this investigation, one may have to use for uh, may, may have use for a firearm. You wouldn't want to have gotten caught with your pants down. He asked me to open a door. A referral, you mean? I take it this was for someone in the RCM? She waves her hand. Don't answer that. I mean like a real door to somebody's house. Oh my, a real door? The lieutenant does not say anything, but you hear the nylon of his jacket rustle as he looks at you. Hmm. I scared Gary from Mr. Clary, got pretty scared. My, my, what I'm hearing is, she says, slow and teacher-like, you inspected the premises because you suspected that it was involved in the narcotics trade. And in the process, you turned up some information relevant to your investigation, only from Everard, surprisingly. <laughs> Her bartering mind cannot fathom that you didn't ask anything in return. Frankly, what was done was not pretty at all, but neither was it illegal, and it was not for nothing. He turns to us. This seems serious. I advise you to be very selective with, with what information you choose to share. This may have consequences beyond our line of sight. Oh, okay. The Union's militant wing organized the lynching. We know that's not true. Everart says that Wild Pine sent mercenaries after the Union. Everart asked the Union's militant wing to fully cooperate. Well, that's all I've got to say for now. Naturally, Detective, there are no lighter to topics to gossip about. Um, he asked me to, to deliver an envelope. Sounds like he has you running errands, Detective. A well-established dominance ritual, she thinks. Where did he have you deliver it? Here. Here, she looks around, oh no, what does that bloated hellbat want with my little cinderblock town? It's clear the village has already grown dear to her, strangely so. Why did she come here? No, don't tell me, I don't want to know what he has in store for this place. Probably a statue. It's a statue, right? A giant statue of him, or better yet, his twin brother. Practically the same thing, but makes him seem less like a psychopath. He wants to build a youth center here for the children of Martinez. A youth center with Edgar Clare's statue on top of it. She looks down with a jetty remorsefully. Go ahead, help him. Make it so. I have no power to stop him. You're quite fond of this village, aren't you, we can say. And she says, I should be. She nodded. There's that crooked smile again. In my youth, I had a brief dalliance here in Martinez. He was an older man with impossibly broad shoulders. He's probably dead now. Even his shack is long gone. Not that it matters. These buildings are all carbon copies of one another. <laughs> when you were a teen, slumming it, like you told me before. I'm glad to see your short-term memory appears intact in any case. I wasn't a teen anymore. I would have been in my early 20s. I remember a distinctly vile disco track. Disco isn't vile, we can say. And she goes, it is, but not as vile as me. She looks at the Eternite in Cinderblock soaking, an overgrown carcass of some motor carriage. Sounds like you miss those times. Not overly so. It's not like this was the only place we visited, me and my girlfriends from Ozone, with our shiny boats like Reavers. We told ourselves we were the worst thing to happen to the coast since the Coalition landed in 08. Imagine! And she tosses her head. She's sentimental, all right. You don't know enough about her to find out why exactly. She'll keep her secrets for now. You would prefer something else, not a youth center? First, there won't be a youth center, whatever he's told you or the residents. It'll be something horrific, perhaps even worse than a statue. So yes, I do. Like what? A fishery? I've been speaking with Le Leanne here. She gave me the idea. The infrastructure is all here, and with my connections, 
Sadly, it's just one of the million things I'll never get around to. I just have to accept that I'll never be the richly can the rich candy girl who goes around solving people's problems with money. So you're sad you can't buy the place? Yes. I'm sad I will never have the time, Detective. I've always wanted a, a dilapidating fishing village. She is more defensive about it than usual. Full of ghosts and ancient memories, she smiles. Has the, this errand yielded you any information? Ma'am, this whole thing is a takeover. Is what you're about to say when a cold streak runs through your heart? Once said, there's no going back, Carrie. Well, I mean, I could say nothing. <laughs> And Everard said that it didn't matter if I told her. Yes, there is reality-based knowledge I can glean from her. Yes, what if something happens to her and you've left one question unasked? Sneaky little question escaped your eye. I'm going to say it. Ma'am, this whole thing is a takeover. A takeover? Yes, we can say it's not a strike. You aren't being let in because there's nothing to negotiate. The union is taking the terminal. If they're taking it, she looks towards the colorful mountain of crates like toy blocks rising above Martinez. Green livery changing into red, blot by blot, like a cancer of the blood, metastasizing. Then we're talking about a war. Everard needs to let me into the harbor at once. We need to talk about this. He's ready for a war. They all are. They most certainly are not, her eyes return to you. Krennel has a thousand men on their payroll. The next batch will be a platoon of 20 men and a gunship. I've seen the Union forces. They're better org says Kim. They're better organized than these mercenaries. They also have the support of the people of Revacall West. It'll take more than Krennel to wipe them out. Wild Pines will need to send more and better equipped men. Make no mistake, ma'am. I am sure you have the money. The question is how many years and how many lives are you willing to sacrifice? Well, what do you suggest we do? First, will this affect your decision-making process? Everything affects the decision-making process, Detective. Officer, the look on the lieutenant's face conveys uncertainty. He doesn't even sound angry. For once, I don't seem to know what the right thing to do is. Oh, man. I wish there was a disco option. Let's go with that. I'm afraid we won't disco our way out of this one, she says, with considerable regret. It's not the RCM's job to make these decisions. Of course, your job is to clean up after them, and it looks like there will be a lot of cleaning up to be done in the near future. So what are you going to do? What will I do? She says, slowly looking around. The wind blows. Waves crash in the distance. The crosses. She crosses her arms and asks, Did I ever tell you how they discovered this Isola during our reality lowdown? You said you would one day. She nods. It may be the only break we've ever caught as a species. The last one for 400 years. Why? The nations who colonized this Isola call theirs Mundi. The world. It was all they knew, all they, th all they thought would be. That there would be something more was a gamble, akin to another world or life after death. The pale was thought to be impregnable, perpetual, she points northwest. Irene la Navigateur, the queen of the Surinese, sent eight expeditions, one after the other, into the mass at the edge of the world. Five of the crew did not return. Two did, but had lost their minds. Ooh. Each of those expeditions would have been led by an admiral. Sounds like a purge, like she was purging her political rivals. It sounds political, we can say, and she nods. There was no precedent for such an undertaking. People thought she was punishing the admirals, or had gone mad, or both. 
until after years of trial and error and the development of a strict psychological regime imitating the cremation process of poetry, or the creation process of poetry called Volta do Mar, or Return from the Sea, the eighth expedition returned sane and intact. They told of a new continent of matter. They told the queen and her counselor, Dolores Dei, that the pale had begun to condense day after day, hour after hour, minute after minute, slowly raining, raining down until it formed a vast ocean. The air is cold and scented with petrichor. There are rain circles on water all around. Humidity crawls up your back like a piano trill. We can put our hand in the rain. So does the lieutenant. His mouth is slightly open as he looks up to the sky. The droplets feel warm like spring rain. This ocean? She nods. The phenomenon has never again been encountered. For a time, the crew thought they were experiencing hallucination. The mass hand, mast hand proclaimed Le Insulinde, Le Insulinde, the signal to wake up. But they could not. They were sane and conscious as islands began to appear on the horizon. There are 78,000 uninhabited islands in the Insulindian archipelago, officer. The freckled face of God, she smiles. You've thought it a million times. After life, death. After death, life again. After the world, the pale. After the pale, the world again. A total shift, she nods. In human comprehension of reality, on the second day, a great skua was shot down above the flagship Lizergeek. These words, man. The bird was preserved and brought back along with pollen. Four years later, the Queen's Counselor was pro proclaimed her innocence Dolores Day, the elected world spirit, the age of humanism, internationalism, and parliamentary rule, followed by, or followed, we were high. The great skua was the bird they saw, the first living autonomous organism, proof of reality. It's the symbol of Insulinde, detective, the coat of arms of the suzerain and the wings of the crest of the commune. I seem to have it in for it, or it for me. I broke one. In your defense, it is a nasty creature who plucks food from the throats of lesser birds, yet much like Revachol, it is also magnificent and rare. Imagine this is a suzerain of seagulls. There was a sting in your heart at the mention before, when she said its name. Leaving us here, we can say, and she says on Kalu, she studies your reaction. The pebble, the largest of the fertile uninhabited islands of the Northeast, in Zalindian archipelago, four centuries and two revolutions later. And this was the last break we got? The nations of Mundi proceeded to discover five more Zoli, or they discovered us, all in the rush of the great intersoli interisolary reconnection. But these others weren't uninhabited. We had to kill people, wipe out indigenous populations, gunboat economies, or they came to do the same for us, or had done to each other. But here, and she spreads her arms, there was no one but the skua, the Lilakiai, or the blood beach on the river of Esperance. It was the new, new world. The Monadols used it to amass the greater concentration of wealth mankind has ever seen. Revisholi, the suzerain. What happened? And we can look around. Revolution, poverty, and the merciful rise of capitalism. And she nods. It's raining, we can say. And she says it is. She pulls the hood over her head. Soon it will be spring and everything will blossom. The gangs will run wild, says Kim. The lieutenant keeps his hand in the rain, jacking motor carriages, ferrying amphetamines through Coal City. Spring is tough in Revishol. What will you do, we can say? And she says, I will surrender Terminal B to the Union. Is that, is that within your means? She puts her hand in the rain. She is silent for a second. We will see. Ma'am, this may well unravel property law this side of the river. If that occurs, we may never see the end of this kind of confrontation. The next time, there will be two strikes. He looks towards the harbor. Then four, then a hundred. What happens will happen. She takes the end in her rain slick hand and starts untying the knot. The age of capital has only begun. I will talk to my employers in person. We will amputate and cauterize Martinez if you handle the situation on the ground. We, we can say, she generally avoids that term with her employers. 
There are no employers. She is a member of the board, probably a partner. You are the Wild Pines. There are no employers, we can say. And she turns to us, rope in hand. You are citizen militia. There are no, <clears throat> are no superiors. What? Of course I have superiors, we can say. And Kim says, that's right, detective. And next time you should confer with them before you go setting events in motion. Despite his words, he's not really sure whether to be annoyed with you or not. Events are already in motion. Whether your actions accelerated or momentarily retarded their progress, even the lieutenant cannot really say. Even after all this time, I still don't really understand who you are or what your angle is. And she says, I have not deceived you. I told you exactly who I am. Rejoice, Layton. You're going now? Yes. Mr. Clare has a two-month head start. I can't let it grow any bigger. And I've exhausted all my options from here. Understood. Keep the peace. And I will keep my end of the bargain. How far along is Cronell's investigation? A confrontation is imminent. They have followed in your footsteps. As your investigation reaches a climax, so does theirs. They are your shadow. Arm yourselves. Armor yourselves. Protect their targets. Violence may be unavoidable, but we can limit the casualties. When will they make their move? And where? Soon. I do not know precisely. They have cut off all communication, you see. They know I've been feeding you information. One last thing, Lieutenant Dubois. I've given the matter much thought and come to this conclusion. You're not an amnesiac. You're insane. Ha! I know because I too am insane. I just hide my illness better. And I'm rich. Oh, okay. Isn't everybody a little no, insane? No, detective. No one's as insane as you. Don't worry, madame. I am very sane. What do you have? I'm overexposed, baby. My travels take me through the pale dozens of times a year. I've got the longing, and I've got it bad. She points to her heart. How do you keep it together? The same strict psychological regimen the 8th Admiral developed when he crossed the pale and discovered this Isola, the Volta de Mar. It's used by inter isolary travelers and other troubled souls even to this day. You could use a little of it yourself. Oh, <laughs> goodbye, nether creature of the Forbidden Swamp. Watch out for yourselves. They will strike soon. The lieutenant watches her boat grow smaller on the bay, its white sails fluttering. With worry in his eyes, he does not know if it was the right thing to do, but he doesn't say anything. You wonder what Everard has to say about this. Slowly, the sails turn a gray-blue as more oxygen gets between you. So, something big just happened. We kind of just made a huge decision. Find a solution to this strike deadlock. I mean, I'm kind of confused as to what might have just happened. She says she's going to leave leave it to... I mean, maybe that will... Fewer people will die that way. Good night, Kim. We can send him away for the night. Good night, officer. We'll meet in front of the shack in the morning. The sea's gonna calm down soon, I can feel it. The wind is turning southeast. What's on your mind, officer? So we'd have to pass a suggestion check.
You were reminded of a poem somewhere deep inside you, the translation of which you don't remember. Nulla sarà cam batio della luce, it begins. Colore cam grigiro e marone, tutti stampati uno sull'altro, altro, trovai un vuoto. All right, I'm not going to try reading that. You were reminded of it when you heard about the discovery of the Insulinde, but what does it mean, and how do you know it by heart? The Insulindian miracle. All right, well, let's sleep till morning. Vladimir says she doesn't want war, so she just conceded the terminal to the workers. As for the mercenaries, she can't call them back. I mean, I don't want war either. Kim was right. There would be just too many people dead. But we still have the mercenaries to worry about. Deuteronomist says, so does this mean you know the pale after that conversation with Joyce? Oh, yeah. Where do we need to... Where do we need the pail? Go to sleep. The place feels almost like a home now, quiet and dignified around you, a new life by the seaside. You're incredibly tired. The darkness and warmth come fast. You're falling asleep. It's easier this time, drifting off. Your head has found a comfortable indent in the pillow. Your legs and your torso feel like lead weights sinking to the bottom of the sea. Until they're suddenly light. This respite, you've earned it, brava. Bask in the darkness. Let it swallow you up and swivel you around while you forget everything you've managed to remember. I've been bad. I haven't earned this. No, you haven't. You've just been. Is this the last dream? No. This is the one before that. We'll just keep cycling it for you if you don't mind. As long as we can. Spin it like black yarn. Enjoy it while it lasts. Thank you, Darkness. Thank you. You're welcome, Harry boy. You earned it. We can fall into a deep, uninterrupted sleep. After centuries of darkness, the alarm rings. But what's this? You actually feel rested. There's no time to cuddle with your pillow, however, or as much as shiver from the cold. The world awaits. <laughs> Kim! Yes? Let's go! Mm-hmm. 
very high. Found the empty trap, heard Lena's true story, reconstructed the execution, made that awful call, confronted the pigs, established the nightclub, discovered the anomaly, got the death notification, and found the jacket. Well, we can go. Suddenly there's a sigh, carried on the molecules around you, moving, flowing from high pressure to low pressure, like that of a woman emptying her lungs. She wraps the collapsing stone box in front of you in her breath, flowing through it. Where does it go? In through the collapsed roof, flowing down a concrete staircase to the basement, sweeping away footprints in the dust on the stairs. And then the beach below the boardwalk, its winding tunnels a whisper away. We can say, I think she's down there, below this building. Okay, why, says Kim. The wind told me. And he shrugs. So how do we get in there? <laughs> the doors were on the collapsed side of the building. They're gone, basically. Finally, my time to shine, says Save Fair. There's a ladder next to the sign. We can point to it. Perhaps we can climb it. Perhaps you can climb them. We're not climbing anything. I'm 43 years old, and I plan to live to see 70. There has to be a way to use brute force. Climbing sounds unsafe. Brute force is safe. Look around and find something to break if the ladder falls. The ladder fails. Oh. Ooh. Oh, let's see what happens. So we could do the pipe. Let's save. I don't want to lose Kim, so we can try. A rusty ladder leads to the rooftop. Some of the rungs are missing. Yeah, that doesn't look good at all. We can assess the situation. The distance between the remaining rungs are rather wide. You'd have to use the mounting brackets. However, they seem corroded and the peeling rust is razor sharp. In addition, the first rung is going to be rough to reach. It's, what, three meters above ground and you're 180? 190, I'm a giant. Okay, but still the roof is collapsing and the wind gets pretty brutal up there. Dismounting from the ladder is going to be hard. Perhaps if you were to not climb the ladder? Instead, what if you were to do something more subtle? What if you were to reconceptualize climbing the ladder? Astral projection. Be open-minded about this. Okay, what if I don't climb? What if I just teleport? The lieutenant stares at you stone-faced. Teleportation is not a thing. Even if it isn't, no one has told you. It is a thing for me. I can't remember it's not a thing. That's not how physics work, detective. And even if it were, wouldn't you need some kind of apparatus? A teleportation field or... It won't hurt to try. Oh, yes, it could hurt. A lot, says Kim. He is in restraining himself from using... <laughs> he is restraining himself from using a parental tone with you. We could teleport to the roof. All you need to do is close your eyes and concentrate. Darkness enfolds you. You can feel the distance between the bench and the first rung of the ladder. All you need to do is... Do it. Zoot! Zap! Pow! Crinkle! It's like magic. You feel yourself disappear. Your atoms fading out of existence. Okay, well, that is impressive, but... Bam! You find yourself... <laughs> what the heck? You find yourself on the roof having mastered the art of physical displacement. I did it, Kim! I teleported! I just saw you climb the ladder, the lieutenant shouts from below. You just climbed it like a regular person. No, not like a regular person, like a phase spider. The wind at the top of the building starts howling loudly, blowing away the lieutenant's voice. Faintly, you hear. Never mind. Find a way to let me in when you get inside. Don't go adventuring without backup, especially if we think the suspect may be hiding in there. Oh, so that's one way to do it. The central support beam has been destroyed by artillery fire. All right, I kind of want to find out what happens if we go through the pipe. So let's load the game save we just did. Now 
now that we know that we can be a phase spider, let's put this and try that. An old pipe peeks out from beneath the rotting boards of the boardwalk. Could this be an alternative path to the Feld building? A building like this must have multiple doors serving various functions, perhaps a basement access. Come closer and look in. Your eyes slowly begin to adjust to the darkness inside the drainage pipe. The lieutenant looks over your shoulder. Could we get to the Feld building through this pipe? Given that this isn't a... A martial arts thriller, a grin flickers across his face, it's highly unlikely, and not without risk to our health, either. However, the pipe suggests there may be an entrance to the basement around. The lieutenant pushes aside the reeds and looks around. The lieutenant's face lights up. He doesn't usually notice little things. And it's right here, a maintenance door. He points to a rusted metal double door to the right of the pipe, obscured by the reeds. It's jammed shut. The subtle approach isn't going to work on this one. Oh yeah, big boy time. This needs you to put your back into it. But wait, what's in there? An ordinary drainage pipe, darkness. Okay, what else? As your eyes adjust, you see some trash, crumpled up newspapers, cigarette butts. Someone has half-heartedly sprayed, a uh, spray painted skulls on the right side. And, and, and nothing. Broken glass from bottles, throwing against the walls, pipe, a syringe. Physical instrument. The metal doors are heavy, and the flaking rust hurts your palms, but together with the lieutenant, you manage to slide them open just enough to squeeze in. Good work. The lieutenant nods towards the impenetrable darkness inside. Shall we go in? Okay, so this is the more subtle way to get inside. Let's get our flashlight out just in case it gets too dark. This overturned table is covered in orange mildew, crawling with something. Antiquated office furniture, last century maybe? Brought down and forgotten so long ago. This collapse nearly sealed the basement. One can barely squeeze, and then I can't read it. Ooh, and we can go through. But wait a minute, there was more in that room. Let's go back down real quick. Durag says the teleport was funnier. Yeah, that was way, way more funny. But at least this way I can go into the building with Kim. Old file folders in the cart. Documents silvery with mold. A series of thick, dusty panes of glass. This isn't just glass. These are old computation components. These are computer components? Yes, filament memories. From the time when wires were cast in glass, slides with an inlaid nervous system. How'd they do that and why? The how was a closely guarded secret, something that was locked in safes and human heads across the river where they were manufactured. As to why, your fingers don't know. Hey, Kim, look, old cybernetics. The lieutenant tilts his head, watching the light glimmer on the glass. So it is. I think these are used to form a single system, slotted in the wall. So this is all that remains of Feld R&D? He nods. The rest of the building seems to have been picked clean. Could this be part of the Feld playback experiment? These? No. These are old filament memories. I hope you're not expecting to find that device here. You will be disappointed. All you will find here is pain. We can finish the thought. Hey! Plus one to suggestion. Uh, Intersolitary suit jacket. All right. I needed more suggesting gear. In the beam of the flashlight, a crevice in the wall. Hello. Whoa. 
Revolutionary hat, plus one to Mazovian socioeconomics. Stale fabric smell and dust. No one has slept here in months, maybe years. These pots and plates are full of dust and spider webs. Revolutionary propaganda on the bunk bed, ancient flyers and brochures. The same slit window you saw from the outside. Could this have been the killer's hideout? And this narrow window the point of origin of the shot that killed the mercenary? This does look like an embrasure, a slit made for shooting out of. We can peek out. Outside the window, the day is clear and as mild as can be in early spring, and we can turn to Kim. Could the killer have used this as a hideout? It's a great place to hide, certainly, but there hasn't been anyone here in ages. Kim, I can't see the whirling of rags. The shot didn't come from here. Indeed, no one could get a clear view. Well, at least we've been thorough. I like thorough. The lieutenant's voice betrays a slight disappointment, which he glosses over by reasserting control. Kraz Mazov Portrait. A mustachioed and mutton-chopped man, amateurishly depicted, gazes at you with sad eyes. A plaque reads, K. Mazov. There is a spider web in the lower left corner of the portrait. We can brush the dust off the portrait. Years worth of dust is shaken off. The full head of hair, matched by an ampule musta ample mustache and sideburns, look a bit silly. Someone crutches. Crouches, heels digging into the wet sand. Hands sweep across the sand, grains sticking to the frayed skin on the fingertips. An old man sits on a slab of concrete and taps his fingers against the glass of a scope. We shudder. It's that Mazov guy. This must have been the hiding place of some na uh, naive leftists. Naive le leftists. And Kim nods thoughtfully. Some radical or radicals were hiding out here, and they left a long time ago. A long time ago? How long? Half a century? This was probably part of the network of defense posts the communards built against the amphibious landing. He looks around. I think the purpose of this bunker was to produce propaganda. It would have had a radio equipment back then, but that's all been looted. What's with all these secret weapon caches and secret bunkers? We have found a lot of those lately. I guess what most people think of as history tends to linger in run-down neighborhoods. Martinez being what it is, no one has gone through the trouble of cleaning out those old bunkers. A good hiding place for someone who's up to no good. Maybe I should move in here. Seems cozy, we can say. And he says, I won't stand in your way, but only after we're through with the case. Could it be connected to the Mazov bust we found in the student's room? Millions of depictions of Mazov have been produced. They're not all connected. Besides, that looked like some student. The use always go for this kind of stuff. Could someone have stopped through here recently? He looks at the dust. You mean, like Ruby? No, I think we've stumbled upon a piece of history, and we can let it go. Boot prints in the sand. One of the souls appears more worn than the others. Oh, wait a minute. This is going to lead to the bunker. But if we want to explore the roof, we need to go back. Okay. Yeah, well, if we want to explore the roof, we need to go upstairs. Six minutes left. Postcard, Martinez 98. A faded picture postcard from the end of the last century shows Martinez as was before the revolution. It's the height of summer. Rue de saint Gillesine is teeming, teeming with parasol-wielding bourgeois, and wild pines flags buttress the walkway. Nothing is written on the back. The glass is covered with grime and dust. You can barely see out. Stones fall. It's a long way down. <laughs> A 
And we got all, all of those earlier, so that's it for the roof. Okay. Four minutes left. Let's see how deep into the tunnel I can get. See, this is what I've been waiting for. I've been wanting to, to explore a dungeon this entire time. <clears throat> and I finally get here just as the stream is about to end. Two paths. There's something in the air, an unnatural buzzing. The boot prints go off to the right. Let's see what's to the left here. The tunnel's collapsed. You'll have to find another way around. It's getting louder, the, buzz the buzzing sound. Loot! A concrete pipe buried in sand and dust. Hey. Oh. Ruby! Suddenly, your entire body is paralyzed. Aggressive white noise fills your skull. A strange pain like you've never felt before. Through the static, you hear a woman's voice. It's like a thousand radio stations are being blasted into your head all at once, but her words are the only ones you can make out. I know you're feeling pretty uncomfortable right now. Don't move too much or fight it. That'll just make it worse. Says the shadowy figure by the machine. Can't say it's a pleasure, officer. I was really hoping not to make your acquaintance. But... Here we are. The voice coming through the whirlwind of pain is not malicious. She doesn't want to hurt you, but she has to. Doesn't wish to hurt you? Not according to your ear canals. Wait, no, not even your ear canals. This is going directly into your neural pathways. We can cover our ears. And that hurts it even more, nobody. That's not gonna help. You can't shield yourself from this. It's an entirely new type of experience. Way worse than all of the previous ones. Don't focus on the pain. Focus on doing your job. Tell her she's under arrest. We can yell through the static, you're under arrest! Really now? Check this out. And she turns the dial in her hand. Oh! You're overwhelmed with a new surge of violent static. It feels like a blood vessel exploded in your brain. Help! Kim, help! My brain's on fire! The lieutenant clutches his head as his eyes roll back into his skull. I'm using a pale latitude compressor. You and your partner have been caught in its field. The explosion of static you're hearing, it's the ULAN frequency. Blasted from that pale emitter Fat Angus mentioned. I saw your equations, it's the ULAN frequency. Saw my equations? You've been sniffing through my lorry, right? I expected as much. Well, I am a bit surprised you knew what you were looking at. Pale latitude compressor. You should probably check on Kim. He doesn't sound like he's doing well. We can look back at Kim. Right behind right you, behind officer. Behind you, officer. Oh. Eyes closed. The lieutenant is doubled over. He's still alive and breathing. The pale latitude compressor is used to sort of make the pale more manageable. With a lot of these, you can force a radio signal grid on the pale literally crunch the distance across it. Signals are relayed across a series of repeater stations fixed to buoys. Not a fun job manning those stations. All alone out there in the pale. People lose their minds in just a few years. So, what we are experiencing is a concentration of radio waves. He gestures towards something with great effort. Precisely. This is an industrial strength paraboloid. It's meant for forcing dimensions on something that doesn't have them. Needless to say, the frequencies used are out of this world. At the upper limit is the large prime number generator station. It's used specifically for pale latitude compression. That's why you might be hearing some numbers. What you might also hear, or think you're hearing, local radio chatter. 
She's been holed up in here for a while with no one to talk to. Keep her talking, and you might just get an opportunity to brace, break loose. What is this pail, anyway? Pail? It's the end of the world. How did you get your hands on this thing? I built it myself. She nods towards her torture device. And she's proud of it, too. As she ought to. This is way beyond your ability. That's illegal. I'm guessing it's patented. Oh yeah, way beyond. She studies her death ray and the law officials trapped in it. Will I stay like this forever? No. Once I shut down the compressor, the pain will end. It may take a few minutes for you to steady yourself, though. It's a bit like walking out of a very confusing dream. Terry Callas, Palun, Ari have you experienced the compressor yourself? Yeah, I stuck my head in there before using it on you. It seemed like the ethical thing to do. Can't say that I enjoyed it. The field was weaker, but I can imagine what you're going through. This is all great, but let's talk about the man who was killed. Yeah, let's not talk about that shit. You were hunting me and fell into my trap instead. That's all there is to say about it. So she thinks of you as hunters, not cops, and of herself merely as prey. Please, could you just turn it down so I can ask you something? If you've got something really important to say, you can do it through the white noise. If you're looking for a deal on mattresses, oh, Rosalind, Rosalind. Damn this. The lieutenant clutches his head, grimacing. God damn it. She regards you and Kim with sudden sympathy. Fine. If you really want to talk, I can dial it down. I've also got a gun, by the way. She steps reluctantly out of the shadows. The pain lessens. The gun she's carrying is a two-barreled front loader, not like the murder weapon. Well, it doesn't feel much better, but you can form sentences now. Thinking doesn't seem to hurt as much. She keeps her talking. Just keep her talking and you'll get through this. How did you know we were coming? I heard you in the passages, and I've been preparing for quite a while. By hiding bullets under floorboards? So you found my shack, huh? I'm not surprised. Her tone is bitter. She thinks she's been betrayed. She didn't rat you out, by the way, Isabel the washerwoman. So nice, she smiles a little smile. That's one knife I didn't want to find in my back. As opposed to the other knives she's finding there now, Hardy, for one. So you're preparing for the worst? I was before I caught you in the pale latitude compressor. I'm fine now. That's her admitting the bullet was an emergency exit. It was dark in the shack. The waves outside had calmed down. She looked at the loaded gun. Then she cracked the barrel open and took the bullet out. Not today. Did you shoot Laylee? No, I didn't do it. I only helped stage the lynching, though I doubt that it makes much of a difference to you. Who ratted me out, by the way? Was it Titus? No, she hesitates. He would have broken first. Well, um, we don't want her to get revenge on Class J. So we'll say when I threatened to arrest her, Class J broke and told me everything. Oh, she smiles sadly. Well, I guess I always knew she was a survivor above all else, but she couldn't have known I was on the coast. How did you find me? Well, we can say Titus told me, but it took some convincing. Ah, oh, crap. It took some convincing my ass, and those guys liked me. I know it. If this is what happens to people whom people like, a dull despair is creeping into her voice. How the crap do the rest of you get by? I do it by asking questions. 
And I have some for you. Like what? She adjusts her grip on her gun. I already told you I didn't do it. A strong moral compass. She still wants the opportunity to make a case for herself. Would you say that Laylee was a likable person? I didn't like him. Hardened mercenaries aren't particularly likable types. There's something, there's nothing more personal that you had against him. Perhaps his way with women. You think I was envious of his conquests? Look, uh, it's not a problem for me and definitely not a reason to off someone. See her confident gaze, her toned arms. Yeah, she wouldn't have had much trouble in the intimacy department. You don't feel sympathy for mercs? It's hard work. Plenty of broken people who don't come with that kind of body count. Besides, they're paid well for what they do. Do you feel protective of the Union? Yeah, sure, and I didn't like Wild Pine sending those foreign hirelings. Me and a crap of other people around here. She didn't hate him, okay? All right, well, I have other questions. Do you have an alibi for when Laylee was shot? Man, I was with the boys the whole night. I hope they at least bothered to impress that upon you. There was half an hour missing. You went out, we can say. Like crap I did, I was in all the time. I went for a leak, 10, 15 minutes max. Our investigation has shown that 15 minutes was just enough time to commit the murder. Wow, now I'm curious, please explain. You play pinball much? No, not since I was 14 and hanging out at the only diner in Dardane. Haven't been into low risk, no reward games since moving into the city, why? Never mind the pinball then. There's a secret way from the whirling bar to the roof. Don't know it, but also she frowns, studying your face. The shot couldn't have come from the roof, or we, we would have all heard it downstairs. She has a point there, says Kim. No one mentioned the pain stops him from finishing the sentence. That didn't go super well. You've got to lay something better on her. You liked Class J a lot. I consider her a good friend, yeah. Is peeping one of your hobbies? Wow. Pissing, pinball, and out peeping. I'm just not following your insinuations, detectives. It's just, the hole in Klonsche's wall is pretty suspicious. Look, I'm not aware of any hole in Klonsche's wall, and if I had been, I would have been, I would have told her to get it sealed. That's what friends do. So you haven't been watching Klonsche through a hole in the wall? Nope. Look, she has an effect on people. That je ne sais quoi, je ne sais quoi, that makes it impossible not to look at her when she walks into a room. And very difficult to look away, but travel enough, and you realize, for the same reason that she's everyone's type, as an object of desire, she's not irreplaceable. But you wanted to be more than just friends, we can say. Oh, so that's where you're going with this? She said you wanted to run away with her. That's a very sentimental way of putting it. We both had past, we didn't want to catch up with us, and we enjoyed listening to music together. Why not go on a road trip? The lieutenant watches her expectantly, occasionally shaking from the pain. Okay, fine. She rolls her eyes. I was into her. Class, she was into me too for a time. I know it. We even fooled around once, and yeah, after that I thought maybe we could make a go of it. Then what happened? She rejected me with some wishy-washy bullcrap about how she was confused because she felt so close to me and valued my friendship so much and how guilty she felt for leading me on. I knew that wasn't the whole story, but thought, fine, I'll take it and move on. No real will there. It wasn't a problem for her. Claus J said you got very angry when she started seeing Laylee and that you threatened her. Yeah, one time when we'd both been drinking, I said some heated things about how dangerous her patterns with men were. I was a little worried she'd blow it out of proportion in her head. All the drugs she was doing can make you feel uh, like you're living in a DeLorean tragedy. And despite everything, you helped her by staging the lynching? Yeah, the girl seemed terrified. The Merc was beyond caring what happened to his mortal coil. It was a no-brainer. Are you a girl like her? What the hell, man? She laughs. Yeah, why not? I've gotten worse. There are other things I want to ask about. Go ahead, it's your body. Hey, says Kim. 
Do you like to hang out on the rooftops? Who doesn't? Oh, you probably mean Class J's rooftop. Sure, I've hung out there. She's got this great antenna. What's so great about her antenna? It's very powerful. I used it to tune to, into RCM frequencies. That's how I knew to prepare for your arrival. Come in. Is that the only reason you hung out on the roof? The view's pretty bomb too, but you might say the antenna was the main attraction there, so yeah, along with Flag J. So you're sure you didn't shoot the Merc from the roof? Yes, I'm sure. And anyway, as I've said before, the shot had to have come from afar. Well, you do have a gun. And? Where did you get it? The gun store. What gun store? Trigger Happy Jacks. Really? That doesn't sound like the name of a real gun store. What did you think? That I'm going to squeal on my gun supplier? Sorry, I'm not that kind of gal. I see it's a front loader. Do you have another gun somewhere? Sure don't. A breech loader? No. This is such a wipeout. I can't quite tell what kind of gun it is. A notchet weight 80 front loader, two barrel, not really what you're looking for, I'm guessing. That isn't it. Do you collect guns? Maybe old rifles? No, they're not practical. They break too often. Well, there's other evidence I want to ask you about. You're running drugs for the Union. I've been through your lorry. And she shakes her head slowly. So, heart of gold Tommy screwed me over too. Never trust a musician. That really comes as a blow to her. We can say, no, he didn't. I found my own way in. Okay, great. You got into my lorry on your own. What now? You're going to arrest me for drug trafficking? A bitter smile. Beneath it, she's relieved Tommy didn't betray her. You're a criminal, and I can't trust anything you say. And she stops. That's your prerogative. Well, you had a financial incentive to kill the Merc. Man, it's to get away from all that murderous crap that I left Jamrock, my previous employer, for the Union. Hey! The lieutenant is unable to articulate his questions. She deliberately avoided naming the mob she worked for. You might be able to find this out later. She turns the knob down just a millimeter, then continues, I got lucky being a dispatcher. Never had to do any of the really dirty work myself. This gun, she glances at it, has only been used for self-defense against serious stuff. There, it's going to be easier to reach mach the machine now. But you're threatening us with it, we can say. And she says, based on what I've heard about you, you are serious scum. She responds, holding your gaze. There's a sinister note in her voice, even with the gun and the compressor, she is afraid of you. All right, let's take a step back. Yeah? Where? Okay, so this went up because we uh, it was nudged during the drug talks. So if we go through all of this, we might get a higher chance. Who killed the Merc if it wasn't you? How should I know, she says. As I keep saying, he already had a bullet in his head when I got to him, and there hasn't been any useful gossip over the radio. Those rings around her eyes, her tired voice. She's been staying up late listening in on the conversations crisscrossing Martin Ames. Police radio? You've been following the case? Who hasn't? She shrugs. You know, I can still see him there, in Clans Jay's room, lying on his side. He was still warm, but the bluish light coming through the broken window made him look as if as though he'd been dead for a good long while. Well then what happened Sunday night? Tell me your version. She eyes us warily, as though gauging our sincerity. It's okay, says Kim, we just want to He struggles to finish the sentence. Alright, don't kill yourself over it. I was shooting the crap with Hardy and the boys over a few beers, like always. Then Class J comes in, all pale and shuddering. She sits down with a drink, trying to steady her nerves, so I grab a seat next to her. Wait, did she also seem high to you? Oh yeah, super. But I didn't think too much of it at first. I'd seen her party hard before. Class J said you knew something was wrong immediately. No, I really didn't, she says. She's not that easy to read. But I just assumed that she'd done too much blow. It wouldn't be the first for her, but no such luck. She was in some deep crap. She asked me to come upstairs. The merc she'd been going with was lying on the bedroom floor dead. I knew she couldn't get the authorities involved, so yeah, you made it look like she'd been hanged. Klaus J found it weird that you came up with a plan so quickly. What? No. Faking a lynching was her idea. She looked shaken. She wasn't surprised to be ratted out, but framed? Her idea? Yeah, in cold blood. It really surprised me how quickly she was able to get a hold of herself once we got up there. 
It was like she was another person. The party girl was gone. She asked me to help her drag him to the shower so she could wind the shower head around his neck to fit lividity. Then she dressed him while I went to go get the Hardy Boys. Oh, wow. All this time. Uh, that's bad that she'd been so calm. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether to admire her or to be disturbed. You think she killed Lady by herself? As I keep telling you cops, we didn't hear anything downstairs. No gunshot, nothing. But even if this is true, the lieutenant forces himself to finish the sentence. Weren't you worried this lynching might lead to war? She purses her lips. The thought crossed my mind, but the mercenary's death was going to have repercussions in any way. Although, the way things are going, she shrugs. Eh, screw it, I'm not responsible for these people after what they did to me. If uh, her grip on the gun is tight, her arms tone, her posture sullen, Martinet has lost a valuable defender. If you didn't kill him, why hide? I saw you roll into town. I wasn't about to stick around for questioning by Dagon La Puta Madre agent. That strange distant fear is getting close now. It's fear of yourself. What did you mean, La Puta, La Puta Madre agent? She looks at you quizzically. Yes, you. Everyone says you're his peon, his human can opener. And that damages our health. Ah! <clears throat> Through a sudden sharp pain in your head, you hear the lieutenant mumble something to himself. Dog on hell and why me, you hear through the white noise. It's especially bad suddenly. Felt like a vein exploded. Who's everyone? How do you even know this? Everyone in Jamrock. The cops, the criminals. Why do you think I'm holed up in here with the dog on death ray waiting for you? <clears throat> if she knows that about you, she must know your real name too. Okay then, tell me then, what's my name? If you know that about me, you must know my name. Harry Dubois, she replies quickly. One corrupt doggone agent with the disco pants and the funny tie. Agent to La Putra Madre. Did someone mention a screwed up tie? I call bullcrap. You're too crazy to be corrupt. So she knows your name. That doesn't mean you're on the take. Criminals make up boogeyman stories about cops all the time. I don't know, it sounds pretty convincing to me. La Putra Madre. I've heard of La Putra Madre. He's dangerous, right? Is that a joke or a threat? I'm guessing both. No, that was a real question, we can say. And she goes, yeah, sure. She doesn't believe me. I'm sure La Putra Madre himself will explain it all to you soon enough. What did you do to this Madre anyway? You've been to my lorry. You think the biggest player in Jamrock appreciates competition? She pauses, and now I have Harry can opener in my lair. Doggone Titus. She's not going to change her mind that easily. She still perceives you as a threat. Wait, one thing. Possibly small, but she said you rolled into town. Was that you, singular, or plural? She might know something. When I came into town, was there anyone with me, you can say? And she goes, yeah, you had your death squad with you. What happened to them anyway? I don't know what happened to them, we can say. And she goes, sure you do. I bet they're just outside waiting. She looks into the tunnel behind you. I guess I'll take my chances. Who was in the squad, we can say. And she goes, well, it wasn't this scrawny dude. She nods towards the lieutenant. You had two guys and a lady. The guy looked pretty buff. The lady wasn't bad either. What else can you tell me, we can say. One of the guys seemed chipper, a blonde. The other had a brooding something or other about him. And the woman, the woman was the only one in uniform. All were carrying. <clears throat> her narrow, she narrows her eyes. That sound about right? No idea who these people are. Literally, says logic. Satellite officer, Bach Kinmer, looks out the window grimly, then puts his coffee down and turns to patrol officer Minot. We can either take a room here in the whirling or go home today. Let's go home, Jean. Nothing's going to happen today, she responds quietly. Jean takes his blonde wig off. Call Heidelstrom. He can get us a ride. Yeah, I think I know them. They're in Martinez, we can say. <laughs> Friction lock set. Don't leave me here, please, Elise. And we gain five experience. Fantastic. I've got to get on the road. Then you can go find your friends, unless you have anything pressing to ask me. Do you know about the bunker next door? What bunker? The communist... Uh, 
Just a bunker. Have you been there? Don't know anything about it. No one's been around there since I set up camp. But I'm sure I'm not the first vagabond to... The worst voice trails off into the white noise in your head. It feels like an aneurysm approaching. And we damage our health again! Lambritude, starbursts, and sunshine. 24 degrees centigrade. Keep calm. Breathe in. After the pain recedes, it's a little clearer. Well, we have another option. And we have a momentary window of clarity to punch this up to 92%. Destroy the machine. Come on, Harry, you can do it! And she just stands there watching him. You did it. The compressor lies broken on its side. It's quiet in your head again. It still hurts like hell, but... You okay, Kim? The Lieutenant Hunter's recovering all good, officer. Be careful. She looks at the machine assisting the damage. Her hand trembles. Ah, screw it. She puts the barrel of the gun into her mouth. But we can pass a rhetoric check high of 83% to convince her to put the gun down. She's truly desperate. She thinks she has no other options. You need to give her options. What options? You know. Maybe I can still talk her out of it. This is how you talk her out of it. It's the only scenario in which she, li she lives. Please just walk away. I think we learned enough from her to realize that she isn't responsible. I believe now that she didn't kill him. She stares at you frozen, the gun still in her mouth, eyes filled with dark intensity, then something shifts in her. Gratitude, doubt. She's still ready to go. You don't have to do this. You're not cornered. I'm letting you go. Day of miracles, she says, pulling the gun out of her mouth, eyes still fixed on you. Then she turns her gaze to the tunnel behind you. I'll take it. She runs past you, then past the lieutenant and disappears into the darkness of the tunnel. Good call. The lieutenant is still unsteady at his feet. You sure we can say? And he says, yeah, I'm sure. He has to catch his breath. I would have done the same thing had I not been inca incapacitated. I think she didn't do it, we can say. And he looks around, then points to the back of the cavern, her tent. We should check it out. Well, that was quite an intense climax, and I wish we could check out that tent, but I am way over time right now. We're going to do a hard save. And we're going to pick up right here where we let, we leave off next week, Monday, same ox time, 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific time. Holy cow, the plot thickens. Ruby didn't do it. And the Class J chick, she probably had something to do with it. Like, she was been lying to us this entire time. <laughs>